Alrighty. Well, with that, we should get started then. I um, wanted to welcome and thank you for joining the California Air Resources Board for day one of the Concepts for In-Use Locomotive Regulation Workshop. Appreciate everyone joining us today and wanted to let you know that this is, the, this is our first time trying simultaneous translation along with the Zoom platform. And on top of that, our IT department picked this week of all weeks to roll out a system-wide workspace update that's causing connectivity issues. So we hope that everything runs smoothly, but with the possibility of technical challenges, we ask that you please be patient with us. Uh, before we get into the presentation, we're gonna do some housekeeping and go through how the webinar format is planned to go. So, so these are the instructions on how the interpretation function works. On the left side, it's in Spanish. On the right side are English instructions. Everyone, Jay, please. Hang on a second. We don't sure. have a slide up yet. Oh, OK. Who's sharing this slide? Alyssa. Okay, there you Thanks, go. Thanks, Alyssa. Appreciate it. I was, I was wondering if it was my screen only, so, okay. So, so we're offering simultaneous interpretation. And so uh, these are the instructions on the left in Spanish and on the right in English. Um, everyone, we request that you have to, actually, you have to please select a language between English and Spanish um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, you need to select a language, even if it's English. So please take the time now to do so. Also, I'd like to introduce our interpreters, Julie and Francisco, and give them a moment to provide instruction in the Spanish broadcast. Julie, uh, please let me know when you've given instructions, or I should be able to hear you, so. Thanks, Julie. So I'd like to acknowledge up front that this isn't the ideal situation. Usually we hold workshops throughout the state and engage more directly with communities and stakeholders. However, we hope this, this experience is able to give you an idea of CARB's direction and provides an opportunity to engage with us further. Those of you who are new to Zoom, the Zoom platform, please feel free to use the chat function on the right side of the screen if you're experiencing technical issues. We ask that you please direct your comments to Alyssa, but if you send a message to everyone, we'll coordinate on our end and attempt to get to your comment. Wanted to point out for the audience that the meeting is being recorded and that all private chats are archived. So kicking off introductions, I, I'm Ajay Mangit, manager of the freight system section here at CARB and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. Um, I'll ask for staff to introduce themselves. And when you do, just turn on your camera and wave, wave hi to everyone. Uh, Alyssa Rhodes, who I just mentioned, is providing the Zoom technical assistance. Hello. Uh, Justin Huang will be going through the majority of the CARB slides today. Good morning, everyone. And Shannon Downey is the Q&A moderator. Good morning. And we also have guest speakers from academia and our partner state agencies who will introduce prior to their presentations. 
Um, for a little more on Zoom layout and functionality, I'll turn it over to Alyssa. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ajay. Um, so as Ajay mentioned, this Zoom format is going to be new for us. And because of this, I am going to quickly cover some basic Zoom housekeeping items. And this is just to make sure that we're all on the same page here and to help this meeting run as smoothly as possible. So the first thing that we are going to ask is that unless you are speaking or asking a question, please make sure to keep your mic muted. Um, we do have a lot of people that are joining us today and things do have the potential to get noisy. The second thing that we are asking of everyone today is that you please rename yourself as shown according to the screen. In order to rename yourself, you will just press the participants button um, that's at the bottom of your screen to bring up the list of names. You will find yourself and then you're going to hover your mouse over the right side of your name and then you are going to see a button that says more. When you click this more button, it's then going to bring up the option to rename yourself. So the format that we're asking you to rename yourself is that you please first put your affiliation and followed by your first and last name. If you are a member of the general public, we're asking that you please just use P as your affiliation. And the reason that we're asking you all to rename yourself is that so we can have a better understanding of who you are all as our audience. Um, just as a reminder, if you are having any issues with this, please, just, please let us know in the chat. Um, so now, just in case anyone out there isn't that familiar with Zoom, I'm just going to quickly cover some of our basic controls um, for when we're having our question and answer sessions. So as I mentioned previously, we're asking that everyone keep themselves on mute unless you're speaking or called on to speak. So the way that you can mute yourself is by finding the little button that's on the left bottom of your screen um, and it looks like a little microphone. So you're just going to press that. And if you are calling into this meeting by phone, you can mute yourself by pressing star six um, to mute and unmute yourself. Later on, during the end of our presentation, we are going to be welcoming verbal questions from you guys. So in order to let us know that you do have a question and you want to speak, you are going to use what's called the raise your hand feature. In order to raise your hand, you're going to click the participants button that's on the bottom center of your screen. And it looks like little people. Um, and then this will bring up the little menu on the right and you're going to click the little blue hand icon. So during our question and answer session, the moderator is going to call on you when your hand is raised and um, they will let you know that it is your turn to ask your question. And if you are calling in by phone, we are going to be having a phone queue. If you do wish to speak, please unmute yourself using star six so that we know that you want to talk. And when it is your turn, our moderator will call on your name. Um, and just so you guys know, um, if you are asking a question, we do wish or we do ask that you keep your question to about a minute and under, um, just so that we give everybody a chance to speak that wants to. Um, in addition to this last question and answer session, we're also going to be hosting shorter 10 minute question and answer sessions throughout today's presentation. And during these shorter sessions, we are only going to be taking your questions through the general chat box. To ask a question, you're going to press the chat button and type your question in and send it to us. Um, and when you do ask your question, we are asking that you please try to keep um, reference the slide that you are asking your question. Um, so just as a reminder, if you're calling in, we're only taking your questions at the end. Um, and if you have any issues, um, please send them to the general chat or me. And with that, Ajay, I will turn this back to you. Thanks, Alyssa. So let's jump into the non-Zoom part of the presentation. Um, CARB's mission is to promote and protect public health, welfare, and ecological resources through effective reductions of air pollutants while recognizing and considering effects on the economy. We've come a long way when it comes to freight and air quality in the state. With support and collaboration between CARB, industry, communities, the legislature, and other agencies, existing regulations and incentive programs have already substantially reduced freight related emissions. However, additional reductions are needed to protect communities and to help achieve air quality and climate goals. 
All of our strategies to transition towards zero emission will work together to combat climate change, meet regional attainment targets, as well as protect communities near freight facilities, as well as support the goals of the Community Air Protection Program established under AB 617. Diesel pollution generated by transporting freight or cargo in the state is still the biggest contributor to air toxics and criteria pollutants like fine particles and ozone that affects everyone's quality of life. Those of you who are familiar with this chart um, or any of our freight related actions, uh, this slide should be pretty familiar. For those of you who are not, it, it shows CARB's various regulatory freight actions between 2018 and 2023. We're here to today to talk about the actions slated for a 2022 first board date, that's locomotives. For context, we first presented this roadmap to our board in March of 2018. The top portion above the green arrows in yellow signifies freight regulatory actions with zero emission requirements, and the, bo and the bottom blue portion outlines regs with cleaner combustion requirements. As this is an iterative process, there have been changes along the way. Most recently, the changes have been in response to the governor's executive order that was released last month, which we'll talk more about shortly. So how does this apply to what we're talking about today? Originally, staff proposed two locomotive actions in separate years. Since then, the item has been combined to a singular action slated for 2022 that was originally in blue at the bottom now there's an additional zero emission component in yellow above the arrow. This means that the goal of the locomotive regulatory concepts is twofold. One, to clean up the existing locomotive fleet, and two, to promote the introduction of beyond tier four and zero emission technology. We'll get to the recent emphasis of the zero emission push on the next slide. The governor's res recent executive order calls for bold action to eliminate emissions from transportation, the largest sources of emissions from the state. For cars and trucks, the order calls for all new Cal California passenger cars and truck sales to be zero emission by 2035. For larger trucks, the goal is a little different. Instead of a 100% sales requirement, there's a requirement to transition all drayage trucks or trucks that are operated at ports and rail yards to zero emission by 2035. And for other heavy duty trucks and buses to reach 100% zero emission transition by 2045. The executive order addresses locomotives with the goal to transition to 100% zero emissions from off-road vehicles and equipment operations in the state by 2035. There's also direction for CARB to act consistently with technological feasibility and cost effectiveness. Factors that impact feasibility include where the current technology stands and the pathway to zero emissions. Cost effectiveness is assessed in all CARBS regulations and balances the cost to industry with health and air quality benefits achieved by Californians. Currently, there's no one size fits all pathway to zero emissions for locomotives. The message is that we must be bold in our efforts if we're going to meet the state's accelerated goals. So this locomotive webinar is split up into two days scheduled for three hours each. Today on day one, we'll discuss the current state of locomotive technology and emissions. And the goal for, and the goal for today is to provide the audience with familiarity on locomotives and to use the discussion as a springboard to foster innovation in the sector. Tomorrow, on the day two of the webinar, we'll discuss health impacts from locomotives and the proposed locomotive regulatory concepts and how they could be implemented. Outreach is an important part of the process and input from all stakeholders is needed. At the end of last year, CARB staff held two workshops related to rail jointly with the South Coast AQMD in LA and San Bernardino. At those workshops, we presented slides with concepts to reduce emissions from locomotives and rail yards. We received feedback at those workshops and in subsequent stakeholder meetings since, and have now updated the concepts, which is what you'll see in tomorrow's presentation. You're going to hear this request throughout the next two days. 
We encourage you to submit comments through the website, or you can always send an email to us at freight at arb.ca.gov. I mentioned that the comment log is open on our website. Here's another avenue to submit comments. And turning to the agenda, this is the game plan for today's meeting. You can see that we have Q&A time sprinkled throughout. Hopefully this acts to break up the presentation and provide opportunities to clarify along the way. Due to the number of people we have joining today, we most likely won't get to all of your questions, but please know that your comments and questions are important to us and that we will continue to follow up after this meeting as well. With that, I'll turn it over to Justin Huang of my team, who's gonna start by going through some locomotive context and emissions. Justin. Thank you, Jay. My name is Justin Huang and I work in the free system section. I will go over the presentation for today's webinar. Throughout the presentation, we'll use megawatt hours as a unit for locomotive activities. Megawatt hours is a measure of energy similar to what you see on your power bill. On your home power bill, you might see the usage in kilowatt hours. Megawatt hours is equal to 1,000 of a kilowatt hour. To just give you context, in 2018, an average US household consumed a little less than one megawatt hour per month. A locomotive moving faster or pulling a heavier train or going uphill will use more megawatt hours per mile than a locomotive on a flatland or pulling a light train or moving slowly. CARB is interested in megawatt hours because it has direct impact to emissions. So what part do locomotive emissions play in the statewide freight context? This chart shows relative emissions of oxides of nitrogen or NOx from source categories in the freight sector in 2018. Locomotive accounts for 12% of the NOx emissions in freight. This is the third largest source category in freight following trucks and ocean going vessels. However, as CARB actions are reducing the emissions from other major source categories, moving them towards zero emission. Combined with the lack of federal actions, we expect the emissions from locomotives will account for a larger percentage of emissions from freight in future. This graph shows emissions of particulate matters smaller than 2.5 microns or PM 2.5 from source categories in the freight sector. Locomotives accounted for 8% of statewide freight PM 2.5 emissions in 2018. It's also important to note that the 2018 comparison for both NOx and PM does not take into account updates that are forthcoming to the locomotive inventory, which we'll talk about in upcoming slides. What this means is that these percentage for locomotives are likely higher. Also, as, it, as is with the NOx, we expect that locomotive PM 2.5 emissions will have larger percentage of the freight emissions as other source categories get cleaner with CARB actions. Essentially, the red box on these slides will continue to get larger in comparison to other boxes. Studies have shown that there are many health impacts of diesel PM, PM 2.5, and rail activity. These varied health impacts include, but are not limited to, lung cancer, asthma, and other respiratory effects, cardiovascular effects, and premature death. If California moves to a tier four average for locomotives, the state is expected to see fewer cases of cardiopulmonary mortality, hospitalizations for cardiovascular and respiratory illnesses, and emergency visits for asthma. With most of these reductions occurring in Southern California and in the San Joaquin Valley, and it's also worth saying that these reductions would have the greatest benefits in disadvantaged communities. In tomorrow's webinar, there'll be more details on the health impacts from the locomotive emissions. That was context of how much emissions are from locomotives compared to other sources and how diesel emissions are attributed to adverse health effects. To better understand how locomotive emissions changed over time, I'd like to show you how locomotive emission standards are defined. Locomotives emit different levels of NOx and PM depending on their manufacture year and application. Code of Federal Regulation defines emission standards of locomotives by tier. The table show NOx and PM emission standards, and you can see that line haul and switcher locomotives have slightly different standards. 
the emissions from these locomotives vary with pre-tier 0 being the oldest and the dirtiest and tier 4 being the newest and cleanest. The emission standards are based on the original date a locomotive was manufactured. Even though locomotives often go through multiple overhauls known as remanufacturing in their lifetime of 40 years or more, the federal regulation only requires that the locomotive meet the emission standards based on their original manufacture date. This graph is similar to what we presented to our board previously, showing class one freight locomotive activities in the south coast. If you look at the color bars on the graph, the bars show the usage is generally going up over recent years. If you look at the gray and the black at the bottom, those are tier zero and tier one locomotive use. Tier zero and one are old and dirty locomotives and their usage is going up in recent years. This shows that over time, the railroads reported an increased use of these locomotive engines in the South Coast Air Basin. You can see from NOx emission line at the top that NOx emissions have risen over the last 10 years. We are concerned that the railroads continue to rely on dirtier locomotives to meet growth in demand. We need new strategies to address locomotive emissions across the state. This graph shows past and projected class one line haul locomotive activities from 2010 to 2050, based on a draft locomotive emissions inventory presented during 2020 locomotive emissions inventory public workshop in September. Class one line haul locomotive activities account for nearly 90% of the locomotive activities in California. CAR projects the overall locomotive activity, which is a black line at the top, to be steadily increasing. CAR projects that overall growth in freight volume and retirement of tier one plus and two plus locomotives will increase tier four penetration in California around 2030 to 2035. However, older locomotives will continuously be used in significant capacity well beyond 2035. This results in higher emissions projection than previously projected. In the previous slides, I mentioned that emissions from locomotives are higher than previously projected. These graphs show CAR's previous projection of locomotive emissions in red line and revised projections from the draft emissions inventory in black line. Railroads are using locomotives longer and buying fewer tier four locomotives than previously projected. Because of this trend, CAR projects higher emissions from locomotives than previously projected in order to meet the state's commitment to meet the federal air quality standards, shown as 2016 California SIP in red line, locomotive emissions need to be cut by three quarters in next 10 years. The 2016 mobile source strategy or 2016 MSS was CAR's first integrated planning effort looking specifically at mobile sources to identify complementary policies to reduce emissions. SB44 requires CARB to update the 2016 MSS to include a comprehensive strategy for deployment of medium and heavy duty vehicles for the purpose of meeting air quality standards and reducing GHG emissions. In short, draft 2020 MSS lays out ambitious and longer term strategies that are needed to achieve California's near and midterm air quality and longer term climate goals. The graph show the 2020 MSS scenario that is needed to meet the NOx reduction commitment in the South Coast Air Basin for mobile sources in 2031. If you look at the graph on the left, the dashed line shows the updated baseline emissions from line haul locomotive, which is higher than the emission estimate previously in the 2016 state SIP strategy. Significant reduction in the emission from locomotives is needed to meet the NOx reduction commitment from mobile sources in 2031. Aggressive scenario with significant penetration of tier four locomotives and accelerate phased out of older tier locomotives will result in tier di distribution shown in the graph on the right. And almost 12 tons per day of NOx reduction in 2031 from the current projection. This reduction will bring down NOx emissions below the emissions estimated in the no South Coast 2016 Air Quality Management Plan, 
which is needed to meet the NOx reduction commitment from mobile sources in 2031. However, it is not a simple task. There are many different types of locomotives and railroads. Different types of railroads operate different types of locomotives in different ways. CARB acknowledges that multiple solutions will be necessary. Here we summarize different types of locomotives. First, there are freight locomotives and passenger locomotives. Freight locomotives are designed to pull off 100 or more freight rail cars, while passenger locomotives are designed to pull lighter loads at higher speed. Also, passenger locomotives have an additional engine to provide onboard hotel power, that is, power required for the lights, air conditioning, and other material comforts to connected passenger rail cars. In freight locomotives, there are two types, line haul and switch locomotives, or sometimes called switchers. Line haul locomotives are high powered engines and usually more than one locomotive are used per train, sometimes up to five per train. They travel throughout the country moving freight hundreds of miles and therefore spend only a fraction of their time in California. This makes it challenging to fund these locomotives through incentive funds since the operators are required to use the funded equipment in California most of the time. Switchers are smaller than the line halls, and they move rail cars within the rail yards or short distances from the rail yards. They stay for long periods at rail yards near communities, which means emissions from switchers generally stay local because of the tendency to stay in the same area. Because of their smaller size and less demanding operational requirements, the path towards zero emission switchers, such as battery and fuel cell, is closer than line of locomotives. While locomotives are customarily categorized into line of switchers, many locomotives perform functions as both, especially railroads use older line of locomotives for shorter routes or as switchers. Not only there are various types of locomotives, but different categories of railroads have different operational requirements, level of activities, types of equipment, and geographical areas they operate in. That's why different railroads and equipment types require different approach in reducing emissions. Class one, two, and three railroads are defined by their avenue, annual revenue, class one being the largest and class three being the smallest. Class 1 railroads have over $505 million in annual revenue in 2019. They operate 24-7 pulling heavy weight, often with trains pulling 100 or more rail cars traveling nationwide. There are seven Class 1 railroads nationwide and two operate in California, UP and BNSF. UP and BNSF operate about 12,000 locomotives in the South Coast Air Basin at some point in 2018. Class three railroads have less than $40 million in annual revenue. Class three railroads typically operate daily, delivering freight from class one railroads to the final destination facilities. There are also class three railroads operating in ports as well as some recreational class three railroads. 27 class three railroads operate in California with an estimated around 200 locomotives. There are no class two railroads in California. Then there are military and industrial operators. Once a rail car is delivered to the destination facility, there are military and industrial facilities that use their switchers to move rail cars within their facilities or to and from the mainline track so that class three rails can pick up empty rail cars or products to wherever they need to go. CARB estimates about 40 military and industrial facilities operate about 80 locomotives. Passenger railroads move passenger around rather than freight. Passenger railroads operate locomotive designed for lighter load and higher speed. There are four multi-state Amtrak long distance passenger routes serving California, three intercity passenger rail that serve California trail markets, and six commuter rails. CARB estimates there are about 150 locomotives operating in these passenger rail routes. Class 1 line haul locomotives make up most of locomotive activities in California. 
88% of activities in California in 2018 using about 12,000 locomotives. Compared to that, class three and military and industrial are estimated at a little less than 300 locomotives combined. These railroads have wide range of operational needs and their current locomotive fleet look very different depending on the category of the railroad. For example, passenger railroads have the highest tier four, while in general, smaller railroads and companies in class three and military and industrial categories operate older locomotives. Historically, the ports and railroads have marketed that trains are a cleaner way to move freight, and this has generally been the case in the past. However, trucks in California have become much cleaner over the last decade and are moving towards zero emission technology. To provide community-friendly, high-level analysis, comparing PM and NOx emissions between truck and train, CARB released a draft truck versus train emissions analysis. There are a number of projects moving freight to rail. For example, the San Pedro Bay Ports Clean Air Action Plan calls for a 2030 goal to handle up to 50% of all cargo leaving the port by rail, which is over double the percentage from 2016. Our position is that we are supportive of the shift to rail to reduce congestion, but we need to be mindful of the toxic emission implication as well. Since large scale rail projects take considerable time to complete, in some case decades, staff compare both current emissions and future project emissions from moving cargo by both trucks and trains. The results and methodology documents are available on our website and the link is in this slide. The example scenario staff compared was from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. The analysis considered total PM and NOx emissions from trucks and train, moving the same amount of containers the same distance. The results are based on the projected average mix of trucks and trains in California for the given year. Results show that the California's current truck regulations are fully, as California's current truck regulations are fully implemented by 2023, trucks will produce less PM 2.5 and NOx emissions. This graphic shows the comparison within the first 20 miles. In 2020, drage trucks typically produce less PM emissions and more NOx emissions than trains in communities within 20 miles from the ports. Beyond 2023, future CARB regulations will further reduce truck emissions, eventually bringing them to zero. Results for the long haul trucks are similar to the drage truck categories by 2023, trucks will emit less PM and NOx and future CARB regulations will further reduce truck emissions, eventually bringing them to zero. If locomotive fleets were to utilize commercially available tier four technology, PM 2.5 and NOx emissions will be reduced by over 80% compared to typical trains operating in 2020. In addition, the introduction of tier five technology would further reduce train emissions to keep pace with the transition to zero emission trucks in California. The truck versus tr train analysis is currently a draft release and we'd like to receive feedback on the analysis. We plan to assess feedback and up update accordingly. Please send any comments or questions to our freight email. At this point, we'd like to discuss what, be, what we've been seeing up to this point and turn this over to Shannon. Good morning, everyone. Just have a couple of questions that have come through the chat here. Looks like one from Allison is asking, why is diesel being measured in megawatt hours? So for a little clarification on that, we measure activity in megawatt hours, and that is the information that the class one railroads submit to us. And we use that information to then, that megawatt hour information to calculate emissions. So it's not a direct measurement, but it is how we use, what we use to calculate uh, the emissions. 
And that's actually the only one I see right now. So if there's nothing else and there's plenty of time for Q&A at the end as well. So if you think of something, feel free to submit it or we can chat at the end too. Back to you, Justin. Oh, thanks you, Shannon. Um, just to clarify, I think maybe the uh, question was also why diesel is um, measured in units of electricity. Uh, we'll see another slide soon, but um, diesel is converted to electricity. So that's why um, we are measuring locomotive activity in megawatt hours. And, and I'm seeing a question from Angelo as well. Are you guys seeing that? Uh, and it's regarding the truck versus train, Justin. So Angela Logan had the comment, what is the truck versus train emissions based on? Justin, you wanna take a stab? Okay, um, just give me a second to read the question. Um, so truck versus train scenario is based on representative um, car, uh, train moving 260 containers for a certain distance. And the truck and train emissions are based on average truck and train uh, projections, the fleet uh, distribution uh, based on the projection. Um, and I hope that so answers the question. Angelo, they're, they're based on our emissions inventories. Um, so that's, that's the basis of them. Um, and then I see a related question from Mike Brady. How do you get to zero truck emissions in 2040 or otherwise with line haul trucks largely being registered out of state and using federal standards? Um, Mike, the regulatory process right now on the truck side um, has a 2035 uh, zero emission target for all drayage trucks. So those are the ones that operate at the ports and rail yards. And the 2040, I believe it's 2045 for um, long haul trucks in this case. So that's, that's how that, that's what that's based on. And then we, Shannon, do you want to see if we have any other comments or should we move on and we can just um, doing a time check, sorry. Yeah, I think we can do, uh, we can, we've got some more coming in, but for time we can, we're definitely working to answer all of them and we'll just, we'll keep going, I think for now. Uh, thank you, Shannon. So we've looked at recent trends and projections of emissions from locomotives different types of locomotives and different categories of locomotive operators. While it is clear that locomotive emissions need to be reduced, wide range of equipment requirements and operation make it challenging. Shortly, we'll be asking the guest speakers to talk about various locomotive technology related topics. Before that, please allow me to give a brief overview on how locomotives work. The diagram shows a conventional freight line haul diesel electric locomotive or commonly called diesel locomotive. These diesel electric locomotives have a large diesel engine you see in the middle. A typical modern line of locomotives may have a 4,000 to 4,400 horsepower engine. Considering that a typical American car has about 120 horsepower engine, this is a very powerful engine. This engine drives an alternator to generate electricity. You can think of this combination as an emergency generator or a portable generator you might have seen where you run a gas power engine that runs an alternator where you can plug in your electric appliances. The setup in locomotives use diesel engine and is a lot more powerful. Electricity generated this way powers traction motors located next to the wheels to propel the locomotive. In a sense, conventional locomotives are already electrified as they are propelled by electric motors. It's the source of electricity that needs to change in order to achieve zero emission. The other parts of the locomotives are capped for the engineer and various parts needed for braking, cooling, and supporting various functions. Underside of the locomotive between the trucks and fuel tank, which can carry our fuel tank, which can carry about 5,000 gallons of diesel. Again, 
considering that typical American car is about 12 to 15 gallon gas tank, the combination results in a high power locomotive capable of traveling 1,000 miles or more between refueling. We've seen that locomotives vary widely in how they operate. Because conventional diesel locomotives are capable of high power and long range, replacing them with zero emission technology is not straightforward. The table here shows CARB staff high level assessment of various zero emission technology options for three main types of locomotives and their challenges. There is no one size fits all pathway to zero emission locomotives. Different technology may be suitable for different application and multiple pathways need to be explored in order to achieve zero emission in all categories of railroads and locomotives. Until now, we've shown that emissions from locomotives are increasing and that they need to be reduced. To identify how we can reduce emissions from locomotives and achieve zero emission rail, we'd like to hear from guest speakers in more detail about the current and future technologies and pathways to zero emission locomotives. First speaker is Andres Hofrichter from DB Engineering Consulting. Andres? Andres, uh, please unmute and you can begin your presentation. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, Andreas, you're good to go. You're okay. at the beach? No, I'm not at the beach and I'm in my office. <laughs> so it's, uh, but you know, this is a beautiful, a new tier four locomotive um, background on the coast for Intercity here in California. All right, well, my name is Andreas Hofrichter. I'm originally from Germany, as you can all tell uh, by the accent. I've been in the US for a while and recently in June joined uh, Deutsche Bahn Engineering and Consulting with our head offices here in Sacramento. Um, Karl, thank you for the invite to present um, our perspective and um, how we could achieve zero emission motive power options. I have about 10 minutes. I'm notorious for going over time. So um, please give me a heads up. Um, I will cover electrification, batteries, um, and hydrogen. There are hybrid options of these, but I will not go into any detail. Next slide, please. All right, a little bit of background on who we are and what we do. So Deutsche Bahn or German Railways is the primary rail company in Germany, and we have leading market positions in Europe and globally. We have a relatively large network of around 33,000 kilometers. We operate um, all sorts of different trains with all sorts of different propulsion technologies. In the picture, you see one of our high-speed trains um, on relatively new infrastructure, slab, rail, um, slab track infrastructure, sorry. And you have um, ed overhead electrification, which is one of the zero emission options that were just mentioned. We also operate um, commuter trains, conventional intercity trains, um, light rail systems, suburban systems, but also several different freight systems, including what would be short line um, freight over here in the US switches, but also long distance freight. And we collaborate with other operators and have very long distance freight trains, for example, from China all the way um, over to Germany. Next slide, please. Um, here now an example in how we could get to zero emission. A relatively large proportion of our network is already electrified. It's uh, currently between 50 and 60%. And one way we want to achieve um, zero emissions is actually extending that wayside electrification infrastructure. So what you do is very similar as what you've seen in the slide previously. You erect um, power lines along the right of way. Through those power lines, there flows electricity. That electricity is then being used in the motive power vehicle that could be multiple units or it could be um, locomotives. The other option that we have is we can use battery powered trains. And in this case, we electrify um, the vehicle. 
Justin already explained the concept of a diesel electric um, locomotive, where you have a diesel engine on board that generates electricity to power the traction motors. In this case, you get rid of the um, diesel engine generator and replace that with batteries, and then you have to charge the batteries somehow. That's one option. And for example, if you have already existing wayside electrification, you can charge these batteries um, under the electrification infrastructure. The last option is that we would use hydrogen in the trains and again, we electrify um, the vehicle and replace the diesel engine generator set with a hydrogen system. So hydrogen that could then be used in an internal combustion engine or also an external combustion engine, such as a, a turbine. But the most common way to do this is with hydrogen fuel cells, which um, I come onto in a little bit. So at the moment on the left side of the graph, you see a map of um, Germany and of around 35% of our regional passenger rail vehicles. So this, these are the lower power ones, uh, smaller trains. Um, are 35% um, operated on diesel power. We have started implementing some of these other systems, but that's um, what we want to achieve to get the zero emission across the entire network. Next slide. All right, our goal for the electrified um, infrastructure is to use 100% renewable power in our traction current. And you can see on the left the diagrams and how we want to get there and where we are already. This is roughly comparable um, with the California grid. We, in our traction grid, we are a little bit more advanced um, than California, but overall, it's actually very similar. For all railway segments that I mentioned, and I will also list at the end again, there is already a zero emission options, and that is electrification. We can use electrification for anything we like. If that is economically viable and the best option is a completely different story, but the technology is there. Um, we need low carbon renewable power sources for full zero emission because the entire supply chain has to be considered. For example, even if we use electrification and we electrify our network, but we source the electricity from a coal-fired power station, then the well-to-wheel emissions um, are negatively impacted. That actually doesn't make any sense. That's why the change over to renewable power is incredibly important. Um, electricity in general, as already mentioned, is employed to, power, uh, to provide power for the traction motors either wayside supplied or onboard generated. Hydrogen, very similar to electricity, can actually be produced from many different um, feedstock sources. So that could be um, from fossil fuels such as coal or natural gas, but it could also be from renewables such as biomass or renewable electricity. Um, it's very similar in that respect to electricity that we have to consider um, where that hydrogen is coming from. Again, if we actually take it from coal, and um, then use hydrogen powered trains to re replace uh, diesel operation that doesn't make any sense from a well to wheel perspective. That is not um, a good option. We will need lower um, carbon hydrogen. So most of the hydrogen currently is produced from natural gas and that already gives um, um, a positive impact compared to diesel. But ideally we really want renewable hydrogen that doesn't have any carbon within the entire supply chain. In Germany, we are already an eco-pioneer in the transportation sector, um, as already outlined on the left-hand side with that bar chart. Next slide, please. Now, in the next three slides, I will provide a little bit more information about these three motive, uh, zero emission motive power options, and then I give a summary at the end. Um, I describe the graphs and in the description at the top is the explanation that I'm giving verbally now. Let's start on the right hand side. I provided a list, this is not exhaustive, but it covers all of the main categories of um, rail vehicles that are out there on the network. And electrification, as I had already mentioned, is suitable for all of these. For very high speed trains, and I um, defined them in this case as anything that operates or is capable to operate faster than 125 miles an hour, you really have to electrify. Even with very energy dense diesel um, right now, we can't achieve the range requirements that we need. So for example, for California high-speed rail, that will be electrified. But also Brightline um, West, I think, um, is the current name building a line from Las Vegas to Los Angeles that is also going to be um, in electrified. Intercity is typically what we see here, and we have a presentation um, later um, on that. 
you could do that with diesel. Um, and this is the predominant form here um, in North America. Commuter rail, again, you can um, do with diesel and electrification. I'll go now to the very bottom of this slide, the switcher operations. You could electrify switches, have an electric network and operate them there. You don't see this a lot in North America, but we have some of these in Germany and Austria and also in Switzerland, so it's technically possible. Now going to the description graph on the bottom, this is just a representation of what happens with the energy throughout the entire supply chain and the respective um, emissions. So first we have to produce this electricity somehow, then it is being transmitted to the railway line and then along the railway line there's a distribution network of electricity. On the vehicle, this electricity is then being used, so it's collected typically from this overhead contact system, um, then changed on board of the vehicle to um, operate electric motors. On the bottom is indicative um, efficiency graph, and you can see that if you replace fossil with renewable sources, then the overall efficiency over the entire um, supply chain rises significantly. The other part that is very apparent here is that, we, that the electric vehicle itself is actually extremely efficient and we don't lose a lot in that process. And the majority of the loss actually occurs in when we change that chemical composition, for example, coal or natural gas over to electricity. That's important for some of the other um, technologies that we're going to look at. The biggest problem with electrification is that it's incredibly expensive and in many cases not economically viable to be implemented. It's typically also supported by um, the government with grants uh, or um, specific bonds at low interest to actually make it happen um, in the first place. There are also other considerations where electrification might not be um, suitable due to infrastructure constraints. For example, if you have a lot of clearance problems, you could potentially um, adjust these in, for example, building uh, bigger tunnels or other tunnels if there is a, is a problem. But um, in many situations, that's simply not practical. Next slide. The next option is now on batteries. And um, I'll start with the graph at the bottom. You can see that it's actually very similar to an electric locomotive, except that we have also added batteries on that vehicle. And these batteries have to be charged. One option is from that overhead electric electrification infra infrastructure where it exists, or it can be at certain distances through um, charge bars, for example, um, conventional overhead wires. It could be a third rail system or it could be inductive charging. There are several options in how that could happen. On the energy supply side, it's actually very similar. Um, we still have electricity that has to be produced somehow. These efficiencies don't actually change. The efficiencies on board of the vehicle are somewhat lower, but not dramatically lower because charging and using batteries is actually also very efficient. And that's the impact on the emissions. Where do we use batteries currently in our uh, rail applications? So we have them for the freight side, but also for some of the passenger side and switcher locomotives. There aren't very many of these yet globally, but they're becoming increasingly more popular. Um, including some here in Southern California. There are trials and I think they will be expanded. Um, in light rail applications, we see this now reasonably frequently where we have um, part of the line electrified or just stations electrified where the batteries are being uh, recharged and the rest of the operation is then done on batteries. An example of that here in the US is the Detroit streetcar system where they can operate 80% of a wire. We also see um, some regional trains um, operating with this technology where you want to, let's say, roughly travel around um, 50 miles away from electrification infrastructure. You use that on batteries, then you come back to electrification and complete the journey and the rest of these wires. This is becoming very popular in, in Germany because we have many um, situations where this is um, suitable and helpful. The biggest problem with batteries is that they're relatively heavy and they require a lot of space. So for longer distances, this is not a practical solution. Also, if we run solely on batteries and we um, discharge them almost completely, it takes a long time um, to recharge them, a lot longer than what you would need, for example, in a car, even if you have the appropriate infrastructure to do that, simply because you have so much more um, energy storage on board. If you build a very powerful infrastructure to actually charge quickly and quickly is something within an hour to two. Um, so not really comparable to diesel, it's significantly longer than that. 
um, that has a lot of infrastructure implications, and this is not trivial to do. Next slide, please. The last option that I'm going to talk about is um, hydrogen powered rail vehicles, also referred to as hydrail. And I start again with the graphical description at the bottom. Um, we have several options in how we create the hydrogen, very similar to electricity. I start with the top one. We can have fossil fuels such as coal or natural gas. We transport that to a processing plant, create hydrogen out of that, transport that hydrogen as um, a gas or liquid to refueling stations, and then we refuel um, the vehicle. So on board, we have hydrogen storage, a fuel cell system that converts that hydrogen together with oxygen obtained from air to electricity, where we drive electric motors. Typically, these vehicles are hybrid vehicles and have batteries on board as well to utilize the regenerative braking and operate that uh, fuel cell in its most efficient range. The other option to produce that hydrogen is from renewables. An example is renewable electricity, so wind or solar power. That electricity is then used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and um, then the rest of the chain is the same. The efficiency at the bottom is for fossil fuels and renewable fuels um, almost identical. That's why it's not uh, represented differently. And it, what you will notice compared to the pure electric options, this efficiency is somewhat lower. It's comparable to fossil electricity. But there are advantages uh, for hydrogen as you can store hydrogen for long uh, periods of time and large quantities of them. So why do we use hydrogen rail vehicles right now? There have been some trials, I start at the bottom, in switcher applications, but none of them are commercially available right now and being used. Where it is being used is in light rail streetcar um, operations, for example, in the Middle East and in China, and in regional um, railway applications, for example, in Germany, we have some hydrogen-powered trains, and these are also being considered in California, for example, with the San Bernardino County Transportation Agency planning to have a hydrogen powertrain in place by 2024, which would be the first commercial hydrogen powertrain in the US. What's the advantage compared to batteries? We can get a significantly longer range before we need to refuel. Um, for many services, this is sufficient to replace diesel. It's not as much as diesel. We can't get quite as far um, as with diesel locomotives, but we can get to a distance that is uh, practical. For example, where we refuel once a day. Um, it is attractive for any lines that are roughly longer than 20 miles. It can be also attractive for lines that are um, shorter than that. Refueling takes about um, 15 minutes for a regional train, which is comparable to what we do with diesel. So again, if we actually have to refuel, we are relatively fast compared to, um, to batteries. Andreas? The other points already. Yes. Just, a, just a time thing, just a couple of minutes. Just wanted to jump in and let That's you know. Have, sorry to, sorry to interrupt. That. Of course, of oh, course. You're good. Thank you. I asked for that. I have two, uh, one more slide. So <laughs> next slide, please. All right, here now a high level ass assessment of these different zero emission um, technologies for the different services. Um, as I already outlined earlier, it's just a summary here. Wayside electrification we can use across the entire spectrum. And from a pure performance perspective, this is the best option. Um, sometimes there's confusion and people say, hey, um, diesel locomotives are so much better. Well, the reality is most diesel locomotives are already electric locom locomotives and we just happen to produce that electricity on board. So everything that a diesel train can do, an electric train can do as well and more. Biggest problem again here is capital cost, um, as I mentioned. So if we would have unlimited funds available, this would be the way to go. Um, batteries at the bottom, there's the full circles and the half circles. This half circles I'm indicating in that this technology can be used as a hybrid, so it can't be used in its um, own right. We would need an additional power source that could be electrification, that could be hydrogen fuel cells, that could be the conventional um, diesel combustion um, engine vehicles. But we see that for switcher operations, we can um, operate with full battery power, especially if we always come back to the same area where we're recharging. That is a very good solution. For mainline freight, in certain um, instances, it makes sense to hybridize that. And again, there's a project going on with that here in California right now and with BNSF and WAPTEC. In light rail systems, we can have batteries with um, occasional recharging regional trains. As I already mentioned, we um, already have examples. And for intercity and commuter, very similar to the more mainline freight applications, hybrids make sense and we can reduce energy consumption in weather emissions. 
Now at the very bottom, there is the hydrogen uh, train. Typically, as I already mentioned, that is a hybrid. And you can see that's suitable for many rail applications, not for all of them, but for most of them, this is also um, a technology where we can go forward with zero emissions. There are two major exceptions, very high-speed trains, like California high-speed rail. Again, due to the energy demands that we have, we can't store sufficient hydrogen um, on board a train in any practical way. We would require several tender cars to actually make that happen, simply not practical. The other of, um, side is subway systems. And the main reason there is that electrification becomes more um, economically viable as we have a lot of trains. Let's say we have a train every 90 seconds or every um, two minutes. With that, we can then justify the big um, investment cost in electrification infrastructure. Thank you. And that's it. And I think we take questions at the end. Thank you, Andreas. Andres gave overview on zero emission technologies and their applications, different types of applications. Um, we could see that various zero emissions technologies are used throughout different applications and different regions. This goes on to highlight that US freight and passenger railroads will require zero emission solutions that are suitable for operations in the US. Now we'll hear from Kyle Bolia from Transport Canada about Canada fuel cell switcher project. I think this would uh, focus more on the uh, freight side. Kyle? Hi, I'm here. Let's see if you can hear me. And then my camera's coming up, so hopefully you can see me. Let me know if neither of those are true. Both um, are true, yep. Oh, good. <laughs> That's a good start. So um, thanks, Justin, for that for that introduction. I'll, I'll, I'll give you all a little bit of um, of a bit of uh, information about uh, what we do here at the Innovation Center and also uh, the project that we've, we've been looking at. Um, so so I, good morning to all of you on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast, so this is just after lunch for me. Uh, as Justin said, my name is Kyle Bollier. I'm a senior research engineer with Transport Canada's Innovation Center. Um, we're a government research group uh, and we care about work on all modes of transport, as you can see here on the slide. Um, our research focus areas are, are three main spots, uh, decreasing the impact of transportation on the environment, uh, improving the safety and security of transportation in Canada, and, and in fact safety is, is paramount to all of it, it transcends all of, the, all of our research topics, there's an element of safety R&D, um, and also making our transportation systems more efficient. Uh, but for today's session, since uh, we're here to talk about locomotives, I'll spend a bit of time to talk to you about uh, the work that I've been leading for the past year on the use of hydrogen um, in locomotives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and in this slide, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, hydrogen in Canada uh, to give you a bit of context for why we're so interested in it. Um, it's an interesting topic in our country because of the potential it has to help us achieve our climate change goals, which I'll get to in a moment, and also uh, for Canada to access, uh, potentially access a new, a new economy. Um, so Canada produces quite a bit of hydrogen already, um, we had, and, and most of that comes from our, our significant natural gas reserves. Uh, natural gas is the main source of hydrogen produced in the world today. Um, but to complement that, uh, Canada also has a very low carbon electrical system, electrical power uh, already. About 60% of our electrical energy comes from hydrogen power, uh, sorry, hydrogen, hydro power, hydro dams, about 15% from nuclear power plants. Um, so we're in a good position to, to supplement the, the, the hydrogen that we produce from natural gas with that from a low carbon electrical grid. Um, Canada has already got uh, a fairly well established set of hydrogen expertise. Uh, we're hosts to over 100 established companies spanning the entire hydrogen chain from production uh, to distribution and also the development and construction of fuel cells for vehicles. Um, more than, more than half of the, just to give you an example, more than half of the fuel cell buses deployed around the world use Canadian fuel cell technology. And, and it's Canadian fuel cells powering the, uh, one of the first hydrogen train applications in the world that Andreas just mentioned, um, the Alsens Corade Island in Germany. Um, and also there's fuel cells used in, in a variety of other vehicles, trucks, cars, which are the most well-known forklifts, cranes, and, and more. Um, Canada does have uh, a set of existing infrastructure that we could leverage for hydrogen. Um, most of it has to do with the natural gas that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have pipelines, uh, storage infrastructure that could be repurposed for hydrogen. Um, and, and also, um, 
producing hydrogen from natural gas does come with carbon. There's a carbon cost to producing hydrogen in this way uh, when you separate uh, the carbon out of the methane from, uh, from natural gas to get at the hydrogen. Um, but Canada is one of the, the leading developers of, of carbon capture technology where you capture carbon GHG emissions, um, prevent it from going into the atmosphere and basically burying it underground. Um, Canada has quite a few depleted oil wells, saline aquifers and salt caverns throughout our Western territories that are good storage candidates for, for captured carbon. Um, so this is to say Canada is a foundation for a hydrogen economy and the potential to expand its production without uh, making significant GHG emissions. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how this fits with our climate goals. Um, so Canada is a signatory to the, to the Paris Agreement signed in 2016. Um, we committed to reduce our emissions 30% uh, by 2030 uh, and more relevant to the rail sector and what we're talking about with hydrogen, uh, net zero emissions by 2050. Um, you know, rail isn't a big contributor to our national emissions, but the fact is that it does produce emissions and, and technology is always evolving. The on-road sector, cars, trucks, uh, are making strong advancements into zero emission technologies with batteries, mostly for cars and some batteries and some hydrogen and trucks as we've seen in recent announcements. Um, and the railway sector will be needing access to these technologies as well. Um, and and, and that's, that's to help us achieve our, our climate goals. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on from some of our context, well, why Canada is so interested in hydrogen and how it can help help us out as a country, um, talk a little bit about the study that, that, uh, that we carried out in collaboration with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, so this study really looked at what it would take to convert a diesel locomotive that, that Justin and Andrews have talked at length about, a diesel locomotive uh, to one operating hydrogen. And that is what the rest of my talk today will focus on. Uh, the next slide, please. So we're starting with switcher locomotives um, and, and Andreas and Justin both talked about what these are. Um, we're starting with switchers because for a few reasons, um, first off, they're, they're quite similar to line haul locomotives. They, you know, they're, may not, they're not always as powerful and typically a little bit smaller, uh, but the general configuration is very similar. The general components are about the same. And this makes them good platforms for testing because, um, because any, any, any developments we make on switcher locomotives can be translated to the line haul locomotives, which like Justin mentioned, it's the same here in Canada. Uh, there's far more of them and they make consume a lot more fuel than the switchers do. But uh, switcher locomotives are a lot more localized. They operate in rail yards, typically located close to, to urban centers. Um, so addressing emissions from these locomotives is, is very meaningful, especially if we can get them to a zero emission scenario. And, and the other benefit is they're typically close, uh, located close to refueling. They don't stray too far from their home base. So this simplifies um, any refueling infrastructure that we would need to set up uh, to, to, to test the locomotives. Um, we don't have to worry about moving hydrogen long distances. Typically, when it comes to hydrogen distribution or hydrogen costs, distributing hydrogen is one of the most expensive parts of the, of the entire value chain. Um, and then there's a picture on the left, just, just highlighting uh, the relative readiness of hydrogen for switcher locomotives, hydrail technology. Uh, we've, we've pegged it around TRL seven or eight, uh, which means that all of the components are, are relatively advanced. It's, it's, we don't have much experience using it all together in a locomotive and, and seeing how that works. Uh, we move on to slide number six. Uh, Justin showed you uh, a schematic of a diesel powered locomotive earlier. Um, this is similar and a lot of what Justin talked about applies here, especially for switchers. Uh, they're a little bit, a little bit shorter uh, because they don't necessarily have as high power and they don't typically have dynamic braking, so we can save a bit of space. Um, but similar configuration, the operator cab and the electronic control systems, the brain of the locomotive is at the front. The, the middle houses the diesel engine and, and all of the equipment necessary to convert the power generated from burning diesel into electrical energy uh, to propel the locomotive and power its subsystems. And the rear is typically where a lot of the cooling equipment is and the air compressor, uh, the air compressor is located. Air comp trains use air power brakes um, and, and the pressurization of the air is done at the locomotive and it's for the entire length of the train. Uh, the next slide, we'll look at what has to change from a diesel locomotive uh, to get a hydrogen powered locomotive. Um, and you know, sh short TLDR, everything after the behind the locomotive cap has to change uh, because most of that has to do with the diesel engine. Um, but it's not quite the same configuration. Uh, the picture at the bottom, you'll see that the middle will actually be 
where we hypothesize you could move the air compressor and, and you need a power converter as well. Typically fuel cells and, and batteries produce DC direct current power. A lot of the subsystems on the locomotive require alternator current power. So you need power converters for that. And there's also the, the traction motors use DC power, uh, but you still need to do a little bit of modification to it. So a lot of the equipment would be stored in the middle, along with the, the cooling. You can see the little yellow cylinders. Those are cooling part of the cooling fans at the top for that system. Uh, the power would come from the rear of the locomotive. This is where the we hypothesize the, the fuel cells could be located and the hydrogen storage tanks could be located. Um, the diesel, this is a GP32 that we, we focused our analysis on. It's a very popular switching locomotive throughout Canada, the United States, they're everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, about 33% more power would be produced from a hydrogen, equivalent hydrogen fuel cells set up uh, compared to diesel. A lot of that comes down to the fact that the fuel cells are a bit more efficient than what we have from, uh, from the diesel engine. And, and the lithium ion body, battery packs are at the bottom where the fuel tank used to be. Uh, the batteries are an important part of a fuel cell configuration they they help with the spike and peak power demands. So if you're going to be pulling a heavy load or you need to suddenly get started moving, um, the batteries provide that peak power, that extra bit of power to, to overcome uh, uh, overcome your power demand. And they also capture energy from regenerative braking. As uh, so the fuel cells provide like a steady baseline load that uh, is that carries on the you know. 80% of the power demand of a locomotive and the batteries supply the rest at peak points when needed. Um, so this is a look at what the hydrogen fuel cell would look like, what the configuration would look like, or one configuration that we've developed. Um, I'll look at the next slide and we'll just talk very briefly about the different components um, because the key components are have to do with the fuel cells, the batteries, the hydrogen storage tanks, and, and, and chiefly, you know, safe storage of hydrogen aboard a locomotive. Um, and these are all very well developed. They've been used in various applications like I mentioned earlier, trucks, uh, cars, uh, they've been used in, in trains, in fact, like as being done in Germany right now with the passenger rail. Um, all of these individually are well-developed components. Um, the power control system is a bit of a challenge. So the power control system is like a logic controller that would be used to match the demand for electricity when the locomotive is pulling, pushing, climbing a hill, whatever the case may be, to the actual power produced by the fuel cell and the battery. Um, that needs to be matched and also coordinated amongst the power demand from all the subsystems. So we need a software logic controller to do that. And it's not clear yet how well developed that is. Um, so this is an area of attention that, that we see as being important. Um, and it, then chiefly, one of the big questions is how does it all come together in a locomotive? It's, uh, it's all got to be used together and it's all, we have to see how that will work. Um, and that's where we come to with the demonstration program. Uh, we, we understand how the pieces all work, but bringing it together, that's what a demonstration program is designed to do. Um, and the kind of demonstration program that, that, that we see as being critical for bringing these locomotives to reality and getting them in, in general use is one that targets commercialization as an end goal and, and develops a pathway that starts small, starts simple, but needs to progress slowly towards that commercialization. Um, and I say small because developing new technology takes time. And it's something that we've seen in the past where attempting to do too much too quickly can result in, in over, um, coming up against barriers that seem insurmountable uh, when bringing in complex new systems into a very difficult operating environment like we find in rail yards. Um, so this is a holistic approach. You know, a demonstration program would need to examine how to refuel the locomotive, how durable it is, how do you train railway engineers and maintenance crews and how to use it, and chiefly, how to use it safely. This is all parts of, of, of the demonstration program and learning that over time. On the next slide, oh, sorry, two slides in, my apologies. One more ahead. Uh, this is just a, a, a brief look at what uh, a demonstration program could look like. Uh, like I mentioned, the objective would be uh, advancing the technologies, all the components working together in a locomotive, switcher being a good candidate because if it's, uh, relatively home-based oriented uh, operations. Uh, it's close to maintenance. It's close to wherever something goes wrong, you can fix it, close to access to parts. Um, you know, developing this type of technology and getting it into use is, takes time. You know, we've, our study suggests five to 10 years of, of demonstration and progressively more complicated tests, starting with something simple, maybe a single locomotive with simple fueling and getting more powerful, more locomotives, more complex operations over time. 
uh, but always progressing towards these key outcomes like advancing the technologies, working together in locomotive, uh, developing the codes and standards and best practices so that we understand how to operate it safely. And that's a big focus of our R&D is how to understand it, how to use it safely. And ultimately the incorporation of hydrogen in, into normal business. So it's it, one day you, you, you stop thinking, oh, this is what we're demonstrating. And you realize it's just now it's a normal part of your operations and, and that's the goal. Um, and this is bigger than any one entity. Yeah, it's something that would take a partnership from railway companies, locomotive manufacturers, uh, governments across all types, uh, first responders for the safety codes and standards bodies, communities all have a role um, to play in this. And it's something that we think needs to start soon, it's start now. You know, locomotives are long lived, like just mentioned, uh, railway companies use them for a long time. They can have lifespans of 30, 40 years. Um, in Canada, as we look forward to that like, net zero goal uh, by 2050, we need to see these starting to enter the fleets within the next decade or so, so that uh, they have sufficient numbers of them uh, by 2050. Um, so the, the urge for us is to get started on this soon. Um, that's the next slide. It'll be the end of my talk. Uh, it was a bit quick trying to prime it into 10 minutes, which I think like Andreas, I may have exceeded. Um, but I hope it was interesting for all to you and I hope that you enjoy the rest of today's session. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Kyle. Kyle gave us insight into Canada's fuel cell switcher demo project. Fuel cells are expected to be an important part of zero emission solutions for locomotives. Kyle gave you an overview on the assessment of PEM fuel cell switcher project and the vision of it. And it will bring PEM fuel cell switchers closer to a zero emission options in California. Next, we'll have Professor Jack Brower. Jack Brower is Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and director of the National Fuel Cell Research Center at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Brower will talk about solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine locomotives and how zero emission ecology evolves and role of heavy duty sectors. Professor Brower. Thank you very much, Justin. So I'm here to talk about a technology that can be applied to rail in many different applications, but is um, still in the R&D phase, uh, not as ready to be applied yet to uh, locomotives, but that I think will become very important to rail, zero emissions rail in the future. Next slide. I'm going to present three different topics. Uh, the first is to introduce this idea of a hybrid solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine system for locomotives. And then, um, like Andreas, talk a little bit about how zero emissions may evolve in rail. And then also because of our historical work in air quality simulations, talk about air quality, GHG, and health impacts. Next, please. Um, click a couple times further. A solid oxide fuel cell is one that operates at high temperature in comparison to the proton exchange membrane fuel cell, typically in the range between 650 and 1000 degrees Celsius. It has the same electrochemical conversion as occurs in a PEM fuel cell where the fuel and oxidant produce the electricity directly, but it's more fuel flexible so that it can operate on hydrogen that's the fuel that all fuel cells like, but it also can operate on carbon monoxide or syngas or hydrocarbons, synthetic hydrocarbons, and maybe even things like ammonia. <laughs> and there are many companies that already produce these solid oxide fuel cells. Um, I list some of them, them there. The primary and most important, well, the company that makes the most of these is Bloom Energy, a California company. You can see what these things look like. They're just boxes. They have zero criteria pollutant emissions and low greenhouse gas emissions because they can make electricity at greater than 60% fuel to electricity conversion efficiency. Um, next, please. So these always have zero criteria pollutant emissions. And if you use a zero emissions fuel, also zero GHG, next. We've also, if you want to go to even higher fuel to electricity conversion efficiency, then you can integrate the solid oxide fuel cell with a gas turbine. And we've been advancing this idea for more than 20 years. This is the highest fuel to electricity efficiency generation type available anywhere in the world. 
to integrate the gas turbine as a bottoming cycle to the solid oxide fuel cell in a way that's kind of similar to the modern highest efficiency power plants, the combined cycle power plants. Now, this is a combined cycle of a solid oxide fuel cell and gas turbine. And we were fortunate to work with a whole bunch of different entities, including Siemens and fuel cell energy over the years to advance this technology next. And this is the world's first solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine system that we uh, demonstrated at UCI way back in 2001 to 2003, next. We also have been advancing the idea of using this kind of technology, especially for the long haul or line haul locomotive applications, the things that have to go very long distances and we're, we want to achieve zero emissions in rail using this solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine technology. Next. And so we developed models for simulating even some of the most difficult routes. For example, the Bakersfield to Mojave route. And you can see here the elevation versus distance and the locomotive power demand dynamics that are required to make it through that route. And we've calculated this for various other routes in California. And we know that the solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine system can actually make it through. And it can also be fueled by various options, including the liquid hydrogen that I mentioned earlier, but also synthetic liquefied natural gas and even diesel because of this fuel flexibility. And of course, Eventually, it must all be zero emissions, so it would be synthetic diesel, synthetic uh, methane, synthetic hydrogen made from zero emissions sources. Next, please. Like many of the options that Andreas presented, very often we must not only have a hybrid fuel cell gas turbine, but also include a battery in the design. This is what we found for going through these routes, handling the dynamics like Kyle was saying, right? The high frequency dynamics. Next slide, please. So this is the simulation of the hybrid battery solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine system going through Bakersfield Mojave. And what you can see is that we use this battery and its current shown here, its voltage shown here, and its state of charge shown here to charge it when we're on relatively flat or braking using regenerative braking, um, but then discharge it when we're going up the hill <laughs> to help with all of those dynamics. Next. So the battery requirements are those that we found here for making it through that route. And it's pretty interesting. We only need 100 kilowatt hours, which is almost exactly the same as the modern Tesla uh, batteries in their cars. So next, keep going a little bit. So this is a Tesla battery pack. This would be sufficient for this hybrid battery solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine system to make it all the way from the Bakersfield Mojave uh, route. Next, please. Okay, so how might zero emissions rail evolve? Next. I think this progression that I'm presenting in this slide is very similar to that which was presented by Andreas earlier. Um, we do need to electrify as much of rail as possible. Um, we can do this in ports. We can do this for short range rail. We can do this for high speed rail like he's talking about. And we can add catenaries around for even the medium range rail. We also at the same time absolutely must decarbonize and make zero emissions all of the electricity production. We also can use batteries. Battery technology is relatively cost effective today for certain applications in rail. It is typically, however, limited to the shorter range, the lower payload, and not needing fast fueling, right? Because batteries take a bit of time to charge. If you want to overcome those hurdles immediately, the option that Kyle talked about is a good one. Proton exchange membrane fuel cells plus hydrogen. And these are emerging. They already have been demonstrated historically in the US. For example, BNSF did some work in this a long time ago. There's current demonstrations in Europe and there's demonstrations in Canada, as you heard before, and there will be demonstrations in um, California. 
there was a recent California Energy Commission grant funding opportunity that will fund something like this. When you get to line haul, that's when you have some difficulties, right? And that's what I would suggest is in more of the R&D phase, these require high gravimetric and volumetric energy density. They require heavy payload and long distances. So you gotta have a lot of fuel that you can store on board. That's where our work here primarily fits in. Next slide, please. So what, why is it important that we actually think about um, using hydrogen or other renewable fuels? Well, part of the challenge is that the petroleum distillate fuels like gasoline and diesel have enormous, beautiful characteristics as a fuel a very high gravimetric and very high volumetric energy density. It's very difficult to beat that with any synthetic zero emissions fuel. You can make ethanol and methanol renewably. Oh, so then you see, oh, okay. So these are at least pretty reasonable with regard to their gravimetric and volumetric energy density. All the hydrogen cases are less than this. So hydrogen is more difficult to carry around as a fuel than these alternatives. Next slide, please. But what you can see if you place lithium ion batteries on that same sort of gravimetric and volumetric energy density chart, they're very much less than even all the hydrogen cases, okay? So the hydrogen cases already offer greater gravimetric and volumetric energy density. But the things that offer the greatest volumetric and, and gravimetric energy density are these hydrocarbon fuels that you can synthesize and make from renewable electricity and hydrogen <laughs> or things like ammonia, which you also can make from renewable electricity and hydrogen. So these kinds of fuels I'd like to suggest might become very important for the long distance applications. We can synthesize these, we can make them completely renewably, and then we can use these in a solid oxide fuel cell to directly convert these with zero emissions. So this is a way in which Possibly, we could even electrify, starting with renewable electricity to make the hydrogen, okay, but making this renewable liquid fuels, okay, putting them in a solid oxide fuel cell to even electrify some of the applications that Andreas thought could not be met by renewable hydrogen. Hmm. Next slide, please. So I, I want to illustrate some of the reasons why um, hydrogen and its derivatives, these things that you can make from hydrogen, um, end up being um, important when you have to have massive energy storage or a very large amount of energy that you must carry. I'm showing here the, the cost comparison between batteries and hydrogen, uh, but you also could compare an energy or uh, weight um, and this is the same sort of analysis that would, that, that would apply. If the um, size of the battery, if the size of the energy storage system is small, batteries are the cost effective and weight and volume effective solution. But as you go to larger and larger, okay, energy requirements, there's always a crossover point, okay, where the hydrogen solution is cheaper is lighter weight and has a smaller volume. So this happens for all cases when you compare batteries to the hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives. And that's mainly because you have separate power and energy scaling. With the hydrogen and its derivatives case, you can size the tank smaller to give you more, larger to give you more energy. And you don't have to size the conversion components. You keep the same size conversion components. That's how you determine the power but the energy scales with the size of the storage tank. With batteries, you always have to add more and more batteries and you keep having to add batteries. Okay, next slide, please. We did an analysis for shipping, which I suggest is very similar to rail in which we looked at the volume that could be carried in a um, container ship, the volume that, and the tonnage that could be carried in a container ship if we made them zero emissions using the hydrogen vector 
that's these green and blue cases, or the battery vector. And what you can see is that even the best case for batteries can only carry about 40% of the volume and less than 10% of the tonnage. But the hydrogen cases, because it's a lot lower weight and because of this separate power and energy scaling that I mentioned earlier, um, depending upon how you store the hydrogen, because if you store it as um, gas, some of the volume of the ship is gone. Some of the volume of the train would be gone because you'd have to carry tenders, okay, as Andreas was talking about. But if we can liquefy it, or if we can make this derivative, like the ammonia or the um, DME, then you can have 100% of the original tonnage that the diesel option could carry that is available in the using the hydrogen vector. Is this my clue here, AJ? Let Appreciate it. Um, just a couple minutes. Just wanted to check in. I feel like I'm at the Apollo and cutting into folks' uh, <laughs> no problem. performances. So yeah, thanks. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And we can go the full distance using the hydrogen vector too, whereas the battery vector can't go long distances. Next, please. So anything really that requires um, long distance heavy payload or fast fueling are, are, are cases in which the hydrogen vector makes more sense. Next, and then next. Um, interestingly, we are um, developing with fuel cell energy under an ARPA E funded effort, the first prototype of this kind of solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine system, next. We will have this prototype completed by 2022, and then we want to look for a locomotive platform to put this on. That's what we'd like to do, okay? So then we can start to prove these sorts of aspects. Next, please. Okay, so air quality and health, keep going. Um, we looked, uh, fortunately with Professor Donald Dabdub, um, we have some outstanding capabilities for simulating the impacts of various energy conversion technologies. And this is simulating a case when 25% of rail is converted to zero emissions, either by battery electric or electric plug-in or fuel cells. And what we're seeing here is that there's a positive um, negative change in eight hour ozone near the ports primarily and in PM 2.5, even by changing just a 25% next if we change 50% of these to zero emissions, it has a much more broad impact and deeper impact, getting almost a PPB of average eight hour ozone reduction and about 0.2, okay, um, micrograms per meter cubed lower PM 2.5 and where you need it, where the communities are most disadvantaged by exposure to pollution. Next, please. If you do 75%, you get even deeper and all the way across all of Southern California impacts associated with making rail zero emissions. Next, please. And the health implications of this are very significant. We can never, re never forget how important it is to reduce criteria pollutant emissions to improve health. We did these calculations using BenMap and what we find is that the bottom line is that over $600,000 per day, okay, are saved in health expenses if we do this conversion of rail at 75% to zero emissions. Next, please. It also will have a very significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, more than 2.5 million tons per day in one of our cases, and at the and at um, uh, even at the cases where we're not adopting that much, um, 600,000 metric tons of CO2 reduced um, every year. Next, keep going. So it's imperative to meet our greenhouse gas, air quality and health policy goals that we transform the rail to zero emissions. And recent calculations that we have done and even that others like um, the Bloomberg New Energy, New Energy Finance have done, okay, suggest that if we um, adopt a hydrogen solution, making renewable hydrogen and then making derivatives of it to carry it around, 
that the cost of the renewable hydrogen all in, including all of what you need to do is not going to be that expensive. I'm showing here results for a 2030 simulation that we did that shows that the hydrogen made at this scale, okay, is between two and $3 per kilogram, meaning it would be competitive with current fossil fuels that are being used in these applications. Next, please. Um, so I suggest that the fossil fuel era will end when the first jurisdiction anywhere in the world determines to make their ports, including all rail, zero emissions. It will then be making hydrogen at a scale that will be cost effective and zero emissions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Brower. Um, Professor Brower gave us a summary overview of solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine and how the zero emission infrastructure can um, evolve from its early stage to the scale that can support heavy duty freight applications. Solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine is one of the most promising technology for zero emissions line on locomotives as we have so, so much interest in it. Um, CARB is also fostering and incentivizing all types of zero emission technologies, along with fuel cells. That includes battery electric technologies. CARB is sponsoring a demonstration for a battery electric road locomotive. WAPTEC and BNSF's battery electric locomotive, or BELL, works with conventional diesel locomotives to make a battery electric hybrid consist. Consist refers to when two or more locomotives are coupled, coupled together. Performance testing of the hybrid is expected to begin in early 2021 between Barstow and Stockton, about 375 miles. The Bell hybrid consists improves efficiency by capturing energy when braking, also known as regenerative braking, and also by advanced route planning on when to charge or discharge the battery. 10 to 15% efficiency gain is expected from the technology. This project constitutes the first step on a long journey towards zero emission locomotives. Bell is designed to work as a hybrid consist along with two or more conventional diesel locomotives and can operate full zero emission mode for a limited time. However, creating a Bell is an incredible feat. This first demo is proving out large battery systems, ultra high power battery electric traction, next gen power control system, advanced route planning, and sophisticated energy management. All of those are crucial to the future of zero emission rail, including fuel cell electric locomotives. More immediately, the lessons learned from this project are shining light on the next steps. High density bell demonstrators in more variable and rigorous environments, more powerful and effective charging. Battery electric passenger locomotives and larger scale component production. In short, the bell is the first testing grounds for all of the fundamental technologies, components and systems that will be critical in future zero emission locomotives. It enables learnings, improvements, component scale, and technology transfer that is already driving an evolution towards more advanced, capable, and cost-effective zero emission locomotives. The final report is planned by fall 2021. CARB is also keeping close eye on technology development and how we can bring the cleanest rail technologies to California. Another example of zero emission locomotives we'd like to see in California is a battery electric switcher like the one shown in the photo here, EMD dual battery electric switcher from Progress Rail. Recently, Progress Rail announced the development of a new battery power switcher to be available globally, working in collaboration with its South American customer, Valet. EMD dual is a typical yard switcher and has a potential to be available in a variety of power levels, axles, weights, and styles. The current main targets are specific operators where opportunity charging can take place during the duty cycle, such as yard service, limited corridors involving road switching, mining, and other operations within its operational range. With potential availability as early as 2021, we would like to see zero emission switchers in California's radar soon. At this point, we'd like to discuss what we've been seeing up to this point and turn it over to Shannon. 
All right. Hi again, everyone. Just wanted to check in. Bill, I see your question here. We're going to save that one for the end of the workshop. Um, does anyone else have any specific questions for any of our specific presenters that we've seen so far in the last few minutes? Just make sure. And if you do type it, I think Shannon, if you could clarify. Oh yeah, Sorry, I don't. Well, I don't see any hands raised either. But I, yeah, um, yeah. If you have any questions for now, to just type them. But all right, I think this one's another one that we'll save for the end here too. I don't. Is this from Abby? I think this one's not for one of the specific presenters. So we'll save that one for the end too. All right. Um, Shannon, this is Dave with the California Shortline Association. I tried to type a message and evidently you didn't get it. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll say, can we save that one for the end too, just so we can keep the verbal questions for the end? Yeah, and this was just to the UC Irvine folks, if, if they would like to talk to the California Short Line Association about finding a railroad that would be willing to uh, work with them to put that uh, their technology into a into a locomotive at one of the short lines. Would be terrific. Thank you for uh, bringing that to my attention. I appreciate it. You can you can reach us through our website if you want to. Uh, there. Thank you. That was it, Shannon. All right, great, thanks. Then I guess we'll move on to the next section. We've heard from guest speakers about zero emission locomotive technologies and applications. Now we hear from guest speakers from California state agencies and the coordinated efforts among state agencies to achieve the shared goal of zero emission, in rail, zero emission rail in California. The first, guest speak, the first guest is Momoko Tamaoki from Caltrans. Momoko is Office Chief of Assets and Equipment, Division of Rail and Mass Transportation at Caltrans. She oversees Caltrans inner city passenger rail fleet consisting of passenger rail cars and locomotives, and is the founder of Ztrans, Zero emission heavy transport. Momo. Thank you, Justin. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Momoko Tamaoki from Caltrans. As Justin mentioned, I am the founder of Ztrans, Zero Emission Heavy Transport Working Group. So today I will be providing a brief overview of Ztrans, uh, who we are and what we do, why we are here and some of the upcoming initiatives and efforts we will be working on together. So let me start with uh, who we are. So the agencies who are part of the core group of Z-Trans are California Air Resources Board, CARB, California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, California Energy Commission, CEC, and California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, GOBIS, so what is it that we are trying to accomplish together? So California as a whole is tasked to take actions to transition to zero emission. This um, endeavor isn't new. These um, mandates, Senate bills, assembly bills, executive orders for us to transition um, have been around since the mid 2000s. But uh, what we are really starting to realize is that in order for us to successfully achieve that, we have to develop a transition plan that takes a holistic approach. Not only um, we need to look at the zero emission technology for the vehicles, but we also need to look at the infrastructure to support fueling and maintenance of the vehicle. We also have to make sure that what we are providing is priced right so people and businesses will actually use it and it is sustainable for years to come. So if you look at uh, Z-Trans vision and mission, I think we summarized where we want to be in the future pretty well. So our vision is competitive and equitable zero emission rail in California. And then our mission is to work in partnership 
across government, communities, and industry to transition to a zero emission rail system supportive of a sustainable carbon neutral economy. So now I'll talk a little bit about what we do in the next slide. Justin, was there another slide that shows a working mode and then the timeline of the Z-Trans? Um, this is what I have, but let me check. That's okay. If you okay. can just go back one slide, I'll just talk to that slide then. Okay. So um, when we meet, we focus on rail, but other modes are definitely discussed, particularly for infrastructure sharing opportunities. And then we also share information among each other, such as uh, grant funding opportunities that are coming up or any webinars, such as you know the one that we are in today or training and conferences that we can go to. We also talk about and promote zero emission projects that each agency are working on. And then we also host and facilitate brown bag meetings about zero emission projects and case study. This is mainly for educational purposes. And as far as the timeline, Z-Trans was established in early summer of 2019. We had an opportunity to work together to develop a presentation to talk about California's perspectives on uh, zero emission implementation when we attended the H2 uh, rail workshop hosted by the US Department of Energy. And since then, through core group meetings, as well as the brown bag session, we have been meeting regularly to discuss various zero emission related topics. Um, in the future, we'd like to continue to work together and it would be excellent and really exciting if we can work jointly on the rail pilot project. Uh, next slide. So now let me take a deeper dive into the Caltrans inner city passenger rail and our strategy towards zero emission. Next slide. So there are three state supported inner city passenger rail corridors in California and the services are managed by the joint powers authorities. In the North, the Capital Corridor Joint Powers Authority manages the service connecting Auburn to San Jose. And in the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority managed the um, services connecting Central Valley communities with Sacramento and the Bay Area. And in the South, on the coast, the Los Angeles Rail Corridor Agency manages the services connecting San Luis Obispo, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And most of the equipment utilized in these services is owned by Caltrans. We have 37 diesel electric locomotives that are used in regular service and 107 passenger cars. Most of them are bi-level cars. Uh, we have two locomotives models, EMDs, F59 PHIs. We have 15 of those. And these locomotives meet tier two emission standards. The other newer, cleaner models are Siemens um, charger locomotives. And we have 22 of those. And these locomotives meet tier four emission standards. And our zero emission uh, draft strategy focuses on these state supported corridors and our inner city passenger equipment that we own. Next slide. As I said earlier, we have an aspirational goal. So we want to become an innovation leader in zero emission mobility. And through this um, goal, we strive to contribute to a livable, equitable, and pleasant environment for everybody. Next slide. So we have three strategic goals that will lead us to become an innovation leader in zero emission mobility, specifically in a city passenger rail. The three goals are number one, decarbonization and improving air quality. Number two, increasing energy efficiency. And number three, leadership and facilitating collaboration in sustainable mobility. So each goal has a measurable target. For decarbonization and air quality, we aim to develop a solid strategy to transition to zero emission by 2035. This is consistent with the, uh, the latest executive order. And for energy efficiency, we aim to reduce our fuel and energy consumption by 35% by 2030. 
And for leadership and collaboration, we want to work with all passenger rail agencies in California to develop an action plan by July 2021. Again, this is also consistent with the new executive order, as we have to have our action plan by July 2021. And to achieve decarbonization, we will substitute fossil with renewable energy, which reduce carbon emission. And we'll also want to pilot and deploy hydrogen hybrid mode power. And we might also want to consider adding battery locomotives to uh, our existing fleet as a midterm solution combined with renewable diesel. And then to achieve the energy efficiency goal, we want to encourage locomotive engineers to drive more efficiently and then invest in technology and software that advises them in this respect. And we will utilize regenerative braking, uh, which is possible with the new hybrid powertrain. We also want to uh, make investment in ground power supply at layover facilities so that multi power vehicles don't have to run idle to provide the head end power. And another option is to upgrade our equipment to reduce HEP, for example, through more efficient lighting and air conditioning and such. And to establish our leadership, we want to lead innovative initiatives in zero emission multi power, and we want to promote these technologies. And we also want to continue to work with the Z Trans agencies, which will integrate statewide efforts, and that should accelerate zero emission rail implementation. And we also want to expand our public outreach and promote the benefits of rail to encourage mode shift to increase our load factors and to reduce emission per passenger mile. Next slide. So our ambitious goal is to develop strategies to achieve 100% zero emission inner city rail fleet by 2035. And this goal will ensure that rail retains its environmental advantage and remains competitive with other modes. We also would like to note here that some modes are required by legislation already to move towards zero emission and others are mandated by executive order. So all new um, bus purchases have to be zero emission from 2029 and onward. Uh, this is by innovative clean transit regulations. And only zero emission cars can be sold in California from 2035. And then the truck fleet will be zero emission by 2045. And these were noted in the recent executive order. Next slide. So here is the high level summary of our technology evaluation and the options that were considered to achieve our goals. Diesel on the left is presented as the benchmark so you can compare it to the other options and for wayside electrification is on the right, showing the other extreme. And the financial and the right-of-way uh, challenges for complete wayside electrification makes this option not really feasible for our inner city fleet application, but where electrification is already installed or will be installed, we intend to uh, make use of the infrastructure through um, dual mode capability. The other possible options are shown in between these two options. And four primary dimensions were evaluated. The environmental impact, including GHG and criteria pollutants, and the general impact on the ecosystem, like um, recyclability of components and effect on water resources. We also looked at technical and operational performance, such as acceleration, maximum speed potential, tractive effort, and so forth. Uh, we also looked at economical considerations, including expected operational costs, cost for fuel, and capital costs as well, like uh, vehicle purchases, retrofits, and required wayside infrastructure. And we also looked at synergy with other sectors. For example, possibility of common infrastructure with other modes, uh, like sharing refueling stations with transit. And we also looked at integration of energy storage possibility with the um, power generations and utility sector. The evaluated options were renewable diesel, natural gas, renewable natural gas, hydrogen, and batteries. And these options were evaluated as the primary power source. Um, I want to also make a note that hybrid options are also possible and will be employed where appropriate. 
and there will be more information on hybrid options on the next slide. Renewable diesel has the advantage that it can be used in our existing equipment while reducing the environmental impact, but it cannot lead to full um, zero emission. Um, it is especially an issue as most emission occurs as part of the train operation in the form of exhaust gas. So it can only be an intermediate option. Um, natural gas can reduce exhaust emissions significantly, but not to zero either. Um, and it relies on a fossil fuel and it is also a potent greenhouse gas in case uh, leaks occur. Also, it requires a new infrastructure that would have to be replaced before 2035 for us to achieve a complete zero emission. And renewable natural gas is similar, also resulting in emission that occurs as part of the train operation, both GHG and criteria pollutant, but offers environmental improvements through the supply chain as um, waste products like landfill gas can be utilized as a feedstock but we would face the same difficulty with having to replace the infrastructure and the equipment in a few years to achieve zero emission. Um, hydrogen does not contain carbon and can be utilized in fuel cells resulting in only water as exhaust. Hydrogen is an energy carrier and um, it can be produced from many feedstock. Uh, it is also energy dense from a weight perspective, but requires more onboard storage space than diesel for practical ranges. It is significantly more energy uh, dense than batteries and vehicles can be refueled uh, much quicker. Performance of the motor power is similar as diesel. It's actually slightly better even. Um, the option can be um, financially feasible, especially compared to wayside electrification and offers several synergies with other sectors because of, um, because of that. So uh, for all of these reasons, currently hydrogen is our uh, preferred option. Um, last but not least, batteries. Um, it is definitely another possibility and have a good performance across most dimensions, but their energy density makes it uh, kind of difficult for practical use in um, um, our inner city rail application because several tender cars would be likely needed um, or significant wayside electrification would be necessary, which is um, very expensive. Also recharging times are a bit longer, um, but to use battery in a hybrid powertrain arrangement will be useful as they allow regenerative braking, which decreases energy consumption and for hydrogen, it allows for smaller fuel cell system, reducing um, powertrain cost. Next slide. So a hybrid powertrain has access to at least two power sources. Many different combinations are possible and the options suitable for our inner city fleet are presented here. So there are two primary types of hybrid powertrains. One is energy storage hybrids and then the other one is dual mode hybrids. So energy storage hybrids have a primary and secondary power source on board the vehicle like a um, Toyota Prius a gas engine and battery. For our inner city case, um, that means first the addition of the batteries, for example, battery locomotives to our renewable diesel motor power arrangement. A possible um, option is to have a renewable diesel and battery locomotives on the same train. Um, the hydrogen option will also have the batteries either on the same vehicle or in a separate vehicle. The most suitable powertrain configuration for our inner city needs will be determined in the next phase of our um, zero emission strategy development. And this work is scheduled to begin in 2021. Uh, dual mode hybrid can operate from a wayside electrification infrastructure, such as an overhead contact system, or power is provided by an onboard power plant, such as a diesel engine or fuel cell system. Dual mode electric diesel locomotives already operate in the Northeast of the US and in Europe. The motor power equipment in our future inner city fleet will include the dermos, enabling the use of um, overhead contact system where it is available. Uh, there are several 
overhead contact system installation projects already ongoing in California. For example, um, California high-speed rail. So our future zero emission body power vehicles are envisioned to be hydrogen hybrid dual mode and regional passenger trains will with this um, powertrain arrangement are currently being implemented in France. The proposed Modi power solutions are for the Caltrans inner city fleet and could be different for other types of passenger rail services. Uh, next slide. So the next thing I wanna talk about is how we are going to get there. So this slide shows the roadmap with emission improvements over time. The implementation year and the measures are listed on the timeline and arrows indicate uh, targeted emission reduction of GHG and criteria pollutants compared to the baseline year, which is this year. Uh, as you can see, we are taking the staggered approach and the impact based on that. Um, so in the short term, energy efficiency programs like more efficient driving and increased the use of ground power leads to uh, reductions. And the next step is the upgrade of the after treatment systems, operation on renewable diesel only and completion of the um, hydrail pilot project. And uh, the fleet average criteria pollutant performance would be tier four or higher by 2030. And the fleet introduction of hydrail has made substantial progress. And by 2035, we strive to have the entire fleet of a regular in-service in a city passenger fleet to transition to zero emission. Momo, I, just jumping in, I know you're towards the end. And I think you just answered, uh, Bill McGavern had a question on Caltrans, like the timing to get rid of tier four locomotives or pre-tier four locomotives. I think you just answered that, right? Yes, it's okay, in the timelines. I just wanted also, I'm here for the one to two minute kind of uh, time check. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. No, no problem. So next slide. So in summary, here is Caltrans draft strategy and plan to achieve zero emission for the inner city fleet by 2035. We are hoping that our strategy and planning could be used as a blueprint for other passenger rail agencies. And we are happy to assist and um, there is definitely opportunity for collaboration and joint efforts with other agencies, um, specifically in technology demonstration and implementation. And this will definitely um, provide the benefits to everyone. And Caltrans also strives to lead efforts for an integrated statewide zero emission rail network in collaboration with other rail and infrastructure agencies. And this will accelerate the progress towards uh, zero emission. Next slide. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Momo. Momo gave you overview of Ztrans and Caltrans strategy towards zero emission. Next guest speaker is Peter Chen from California Energy Commission. Peter. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Chen. I work at the California Energy Commission in our Energy Research and Development Division. I'm a mechanical engineer and I work primarily on transportation related uh, research. I wanna thank CARB again for the opportunity to present today on, on um, some activities that CC is doing uh, related to zero emission vehicles and infrastructure, including some work that we um, have underway uh, related to zero emission rail technology. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide again, sorry. Okay, um, so today I'll briefly go over some policy drivers and what they mean for zero emission transportation, as well as our energy system. I'll give a brief overview of three funding programs administered by the CC and the work that they're doing to accelerate zero emission transportation technology adoption. All these programs also have the potential to play a role in advancing zero emission rail. Then I will discuss some current funding opportunities for zero emission vehicles and infrastructure, including one that we have um, that's focused on zero emission rail as well as marine applications. Finally, I'll go over the importance of public engagement with our programs and how um, you can help shape our future funding priorities. Next slide. So transportation electrification is a cornerstone strategy to meeting our state decarbonization goals, including reaching carbon neutrality by 2045. Pursuing of these 
goals, the state is also transitioning to a zero carbon electricity grid by 2045. As mentioned earlier in the uh, earlier car presentation, um, the governor's recent executive order set some additional goals to transition passenger cars and trucks, medium heavy duty vehicles, trailers, trucks, and off-road vehicles and equipment to 100% zero emission technology where feasible. As we see more of these zero emission vehicles entering the market, we need to implement strategies to increase customer satisfaction. This is important for ensuring uh, market acceptance of the technology. We need to ensure equitable electrification so that the benefits of zero emission is felt by all, the Cal by all Californians and not just the wealthy. And we also need to minimize impacts to the electricity grid. As we continue to move towards a carbon neutral economy, we also see hydrogen produced with renewable electricity um, as a potential important player as a zero emission transportation fuel as it, it can also play a role in um, long-term energy storage for uh, grid reliability and also as a low carbon resource for decarbonizing some difficult to abate sectors uh, which include the industrial sector, the natural gas system, uh, as well as heavy transport. Next slide. So the first program I'm going to talk to you about is the Electric Program Investment Charge or EPIC program. Uh, this program is funded through an electricity investor owned utility ratepayer surcharge. EPIC invests over $130 million annually to fund clean energy technology projects that promote greater electricity reliability lower costs, increased safety, and other benefits to electricity ratepayers. Transportation electrification is one of many EPIC research focused areas. And what it's focusing on is, so as, as more of these electric vehicles, especially heavier duty vehicles are deployed and plugged into the grid, it becomes more important to develop solutions to help manage their charging uh, so that electricity costs can be kept low for the customer and also um, there, we're looking to opportunities to leverage these vehicles as flexible resources to the grid um, rather than just being a detrimental load. EPIC is also interested in demonstrating emerging long duration storage technologies, which could include green electrolytic hydrogen as we continue integrating more and more renewables onto our grid. Next slide. So the natural gas R&D program is quite analogous to EPIC. Um, where it's funded and said by a natural gas ratepayer surcharge. This program invests $24 million annually to fund public interest research and development activities to overcome barriers to achieving California's statutory energy goals and also benefiting the ratepayers. Transportation is one of the natural gas program's research areas and our efforts here have focused primarily on optimizing the production as well as the end use of renewable gas um, this includes biomethane and hydrogen as uh, a transportation fuel for zero and near zero emission heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. The Clean Transportation Program, uh, this is another uh, relatively large program. Uh, it was formerly known as the Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program, and it has an annual budget of $100 million, which it invests in a variety of projects to, de to develop and deploy uh, innovative technologies that transform California's fuel and vehicle types to help attain to state climate policies. Um, some complementary goals of this program include improving air quality, uh, investing in low income and disadvantaged communities, promoting economic development, increasing alternative fuel use, and reducing dependence on petroleum. Some notable investments of this program uh, include the Cal EV VIP program, which funds uh, publicly accessible light duty vehicle chargers. Um, this program is also responsible for funding California's network of hydrogen fueling stations. And in, currently um, there's a lot of activity around uh, funding infrastructure development for zero emission, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. So this slide shows that we have uh, just around over $100 million in active grant funding opportunities targeting various aspects of zero emission vehicles and infrastructure development. Although most of these solicitations are related to on-road vehicles, I do want to point out GFO 2604, um, which is focusing on demonstrating zero emission hydrogen fuel cells, uh, as well as the supporting fueling infrastructure for switcher locomotives and hovercraft operating at California ports. So it's just some a little, little bit more background on this. Um, we targeted 
uh, locomotives and hovercrafts because they are both challenging to electrify. Um, they consume high quantities of diesel fuel and that uh, equates to um, having a very heavy impact on local air quality around the ports. We uh, also target ports because they have the potential to operate as important clusters for hydrogen where fueling infrastructure can potentially be leveraged by multiple vehicle types. So for example, the same fueling infrastructure could be used by locomotives, trucks, cargo handling equipment, um, or even a hovercraft. And uh, even though hydrogen costs are high today, um, there have been significant studies that have shown costs will come down with greater scale and greater utilization of the fuel. So right now, the applications for this solicitation are being review, reviewed, and we hope to uh, announce some awardees uh, late in November or early December. Next slide. So in summary, although most of the funding today offered by the CC is targeting uh, electrifying on-road vehicles, the CC's funding programs that I present on are supporting zero emission rail technology advancement and can, con and can continue doing so in the future, just depending on our um, program priorities. Uh, we will continue working closely on the topic of zero emission rail with uh, other state agencies like CARB, Caltrans, and GoBiz uh, through the uh, ZTrans initiative. Um, and I highly recommend also staying engaged with the CEC's public process. Um, we regularly hold public workshops when we're developing our investment plans, um, as well as our solicitations. And um, those are great uh, uh, workshops to attend if you want to provide um, feedback and input uh, to help guide our uh, future funding priorities. Um, I also invite you to check out empowerinnovation.net. This is a um, website that the CEC launched to assist community organizations, um, industry entrepreneurs, and other clean energy stakeholders by providing some networking and funding resources so you can uh, more actively participate in our uh, grant funding opportunities. Next slide. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Peter gave you overview on CEC's program and great resources that uh, support um, zero emission um, goal in California. The next guest speaker is Kylan Rathjen. Kylan is special advisor of zero emission vehicle market development at Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development or GOBIS. Kylan? Great, thank you so much, Justin. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to folks today. So uh, as Justin said, my name is Kylan Rathjen. I work at the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, or GoBiz. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so um, GoBiz serves as the state of California's leader for job growth, economic development, and business assistance efforts. Within GoBiz, we have a specialized team to support zero emission vehicle market development. So that's the team I'm a part of. Um, in the past, we've worked primarily on supporting um, all forms of zero emission vehicle te uh, technology deployment, mostly in the light and heavy and medium duty vehicle space. But our team is here to support um, zero emission vehicle rail projects. GoBiz also has a unit that works on goods movement and sustainable freight. So there's a lot of synergies with the work we do to support economic development statewide and the work of this interagency group. So GoBiz primarily provides high level coordination between the California state agencies and department. And we also provide direct support to businesses uh, seeking to expand or, uh, or move to California. Uh, and our primary role within this group is to connect um, larger uh, zero emission vehicle goals within um, the framework of a zero emission rail. So we're combining the two together so that the ecosystem works um, efficiently. Um, as a part of the governor's recent executive order, um, our team has been tasked to develop a zero emission vehicle market development strategy by the end of January. Uh, this strategy will clearly articulate the roles and responsibilities of each agency and department within the state as we work towards these ZEV goals as a state. Um, our responsibility as a part of this group is to ensure that um, zero, emission via, zero emission rail is a part of that uh, strategy. And within the state, we advocate for increased equity, competitiveness, and sustainability in the transportation and freight sectors. And rail is a clearly a part of that vision. 
Uh, we also look for opportunities to co-locate um, ZEV infrastructure by working with industry and our partners to get the best bang for our buck statewide to um, install this equipment. Um, beyond high level collaboration with state agencies, we also provide direct support to businesses. Um, for any business seeking to expand and grow in California, but um, we have again that team specifically working on zero emission vehicles. Um, we provide support for uh, site selection services, incentive navigation. Um, I wanna just convey that if, if you're interested in developing a project in California, there is a team of folks that are here to help support you and provide incentives you might need and walk you through the process, introduce you to folks if you're not familiar with the policy landscape in California, um, you know, we're, we're here to help. Um, beyond incentive navigation and site selection, um, we also provide permitting support. We have a team at GoBiz working on that. Um, additionally, our office um, issues permitting guidebooks on electric vehicle charging stations and hydrogen refueling stations. So those uh, uh, permitting guidebooks are really a, a backbone of knowledge for uh, local governments throughout California. And we have deep partnerships within local jurisdictions to help you get your projects over the line if um, needed. Uh, and lastly, we also support an interagency working group with our sister agency, OPR, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, uh, to support the competitiveness and sustainability of the freight sector. So that's a, a brief overview of what uh, GoBiz does and how we can contribute to this working group. And I'm looking forward to seeing many more zero emission vehicle rail projects on the road in the coming years. Uh, thank you. So handing it back to Justin. Thank you, Kylan. Kylan gave you overview on support or uh, uh, rose of GoBiz and GoBiz strategies towards zero emission rail in California. Caltrans, CEC, and GoBiz highlighted their strategies towards competitive and equitable zero emission rail in California. California agents have been working together through Z-Trans since 2019 to move towards zero emission rail. To achieve zero emission rail, CARB is focusing on two fronts. One is partnership and the other is technology. CARB has been actively engaging with Z-Trans agencies to work towards the common goal of zero emission rail in California and encouraging OEMs and railroads to join CARB in paving the way pathway to zero emission rail. The other front is the technology, where we're fostering and incentivizing zero emission technology. In previous slides, we've shown BNSF WebTech project as an example of CARB fostering and incentivizing zero emission rail technology. CARB would like to see zero emission locomotives that are in development using California in near future. To incentivize zero emission locomotives in California, CARB has various funding programs that locomotives may be eligible for. This table shows some funding programs, eligible project types, and links to more information. Core and Prop 1B funds are all committed, so they are included here. CARB staff are actively working together to find areas where state incentives will work well for locomotive operators. Please note that availability of funding depends on the funding cycle for individual program. Please check individual program for more detail. On September 23rd, California's government issued an executive order. Among other things, the order requires that CARB shall develop and propose strategies to achieve 100% zero emissions from off-road vehicles and equipment operations in the state by 2035. This includes locomotives. As we've heard from several agencies and institutions, we're working towards a goal of zero emission rail and there are pathways to get there. However, because of wide range of operations, different solutions will be needed for different applications. This includes battery electric locomotives, fuel cell locomotives, and other creative solutions that may look different from traditional locomotives. To achieve this goal, CARB has identified feasible pathways for different applications and equipment types. Battery electric pathways may be most suitable for low usage, short range operations, such as class three rails and military and industry switchers and some passenger rail routes. There could also be potential for non-locomotive solutions, such as battery electric rail car movers that are already commercialized. As another example of solutions that is outside the locomotive, is using zero emission multiple units instead of passenger locomotives. Multiple units are similar to light rail vehicles you see in the urban areas. And San Bernardino County Transportation Authority 
plans to bring a fuel cell multiple unit to their nine mile route in 2022. For locomotives that require higher power and longer range, different technology may be needed, such as solid oxide fuel cell. Challenge here is that not all zero emission technologies are at the same level of development. In all cases, CARB envisions that the technology demonstration needs to be scaled up from laboratory scale all the way to the Lionel to commercialization. Freight Lionel locomotives are the most challenging types to go to zero emission. To get there, technology developed from switchers and passenger locomotives will help. So where are we in pursuing the goal of zero emission rail? And when could we get there? This slide shows the three types of common locomotive types and expected timeline towards zero emissions. If the indicated demonstration are successful, the expected timeline here shows when they could be going into the commercial market and bring real benefits. The pathway to zero emission rail will require multiple technologies such as battery electric, PEM fuel cell, and solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine. We think that passenger locomotives can begin transition to zero emission by 2030. PEM fuel cell, we see now in some cars and forklifts, are a viable option for passenger railroads. As an example, SPCTA is planning to demonstrate a fuel cell multiple unit in 2022. We think switchers can begin transition to zero emission by 2025. Switchers will be a good application for both fuel cells and batteries. As we heard from Kyle from Transport Canada and Peter from CEC, there are potential demo projects using PEM fuel cell switchers. And we've shown EMD Jewel as an example of OEMs working with customers to bring battery electric switchers to market. For line of locomotives, the pathways are more challenging. CARB assesses that solid dioxide fuel cell gas turbine is the most promising option to zero emissions line haul locomotives. But the technology has never been demonstrated in a locomotive application. However, with broad coordination among manufacturers, research institutions, and railroads, it will be possible to begin turning over line on locomotives to zero emission by 2030. A comprehensive analysis of various zero emission pathways for California and the nationwide fleet is available through University of Illinois Freight Rail Report, available on the CARB locomotive website. The report analyzed costs and deployment scenarios of several zero emission locomotive technologies and associated challenges. We've looked at current state of technology and pathways to zero emission rail from various speakers from other organizations and California agencies. Governor's new executive order requires California to achieve zero emission rail by 2035. Technologies are advancing and some zero emission technologies are ready to be used for locomotives and some technologies close to being used in locomotives. Agencies have shared vision for zero emission rail identify multiple potential pathways, and we have Z-Trans to facilitate coordination. While it is challenging, using multiple pathways that are suitable for different applications, competitive zero emission rail is certainly feasible. Unlike the light duty market and even the heavy duty market, rail is small universe and coordination for the ultimate goal of zero emission needs to spend beyond just California and needs to be coordinated broadly CARB would like to encourage OEMs and railroads to continue the discussion and join us in path towards zero emission rail in California. Here are the next steps. CARB would like to have more regular discussions with the stakeholders to bring zero emission rail to California. The common log is open for the next two weeks and we're going to keep working on the regulatory concepts that we presented at the tomorrow's webinar. After that, We'll draft some regulatory language. We'll be presenting this to our board in early 2022. However, throughout the whole development process, we'll be taking your ideas and your input. For more details on the regulatory package planned in late 2021, please join us for the day two of the webinar at tomorrow nine Pacific time. You can look for the draft package in 2021 and we'll discuss the regulatory concepts in tomorrow's webinar. And here's where you can get home get a hold of us 
with your input or ask us any questions even when the comment log is closed. That was the end of the presentation. We'd like to discuss what we've been seeing and I'll turn this over to Shannon. All right, thanks, Justin. I've got, I wanna go back to a couple of questions from the beginning here. And again, this is kind of the end. So we're gonna wrap everything up, all the questions that we've gotten throughout. And if you have any questions that you wanna speak, um, please raise your hand on Zoom and we'll kind of go back and forth between the chat and the speaking. And if you're gonna speak, please try and keep your comments to a minute so that there's a bunch of people that wanna speak. Everyone gets a chance. So, and actually I will go to the, there was a question for Caltrans. Let me get back to it. Um, so this is from Janet for Caltrans. If renewable diesel is used as a transition technology, what would be the time frame of use before moving to hydrogen or other long-term technologies? Momo, I think that one's for you. Yes. So I think we try to put that on a milestone slide. I don't know if Justin's able to go back to that. So we definitely want to use renewable diesel. Um, let's see. Twenty twenty five is the um, draft um, milestone timeline that we put, and then we want to shift towards um, complete zero emission um, in the 2030, 2035 horizon. And so 2030, I think I listed tier four or higher. And then 2035 is of course our uh, target for uh, full zero emission implementation. But again, this is a preliminary draft um, strategy at this point. It has to be approved and adopted by uh, many reviewer, but that's, that's our goal. So the renewable diesel, we're looking at 2025 uh, timeline. All right. I'm going back, so I'm scrolling up here to go back to some of the earlier questions that we had to skip over. So this is another one. This is one from Abby for, I believe this one is for Ian in the South Coast. The question is, does the 2016 CARB SIP include the proposed South Coast locomotive idling limit, or did that end up getting left out? Hi, this is Ian McMillan from South Coast AQMD. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think if I understand it correctly, uh, I think this is asking about our existing railroad uh, regulations um, that uh, uh, were litigated and, and ultimately uh, those regulations are not being enforced. Uh, so I don't know that the SIP uh, inventory or the SIP itself includes uh, any assumptions about um, those regulations being put into effect. Uh, although I think certainly on the inventory, uh, what CARB discussed in the beginning of this presentation uh, probably has a, a bigger effect on all that, but uh, how all that relates to what that new inventory is and whether or not um, South Coast's uh, regulations were folded into there. I think CARB is better, probably better uh, equipped to answer what they, what, what's in the most recent inventory, but my understanding is, is I don't think it is. I, I think that answers the question. All right, it looks like the person who asked it is just joining back in, so I'll give her a second. Um, we can jump to another one. Justin, this one I think is for you um, from Dave Cook. Why wait until 2022 for zero emission switcher locomotives when they are running in the South Coast now? To be clear, CARB is not waiting and we want zero emission locomotives as soon as possible in California. Uh, CARB supports them a project where we can, but we don't make projects happen. So rail operators are and have been free to invest in zero emission locomotives. I like to emphasize again, it is one of the goal of today's webinar to encourage OEMs and the railroads to work towards further use of zero emission locomotives. All right, thanks, Justin. And then um, I think there were kind of similar questions from Bill Moyer and Abby asking about kind of NOx emissions and mode shift and um, 
we mentioned in this presentation truck versus train so we can put a link i can put that into the chat and we can uh we would encourage any more questions about truck versus train or input on the analysis we'd really appreciate you to provide that feedback so we'll get the link to truck versus train analysis in the chat here and i believe the link is also in the presentation so there's a couple ways for you to get to that information Uh, let's see, I'm then just scrolling through here. Um, we have a question on slide 31 for the presentation, if we can jump back to that. So this is another truck versus train. What is the unit of time? Pounds per vehicle per what time period? I believe this is per year. Justin, correct me if I'm wrong. Yep, um, I answered on the chat box. Um, essentially, the uh, the unit is the emission are in total pounds. It because the how truck versus train analysis is done. It is based on a scenario moving 260 containers for set distance. So this is not a normalized value, um, but you can find more details on the website. I also posted the link to the website on the chat box, and it's also mm -hmm. available. Um, on the slide deck. All right, and it looks like we have another for Momo and Justin. Early on, tier locomotives were defined as what they were in the year they were manufactured. I'm wondering, hoping that when older, originally manufactured tier one locomotives are retrofitted to hydrogen rail, that they will be reclassed as a higher tier. Am I correct? Uh, yes, Gord, that is correct. Um, the tier, when locals are remanufactured, tier can be improved to cleaner tier and they cannot uh, revert back to old, uh, third year tier. Yeah, actually the uh, F59PH1, it was uh, retrofitted to tier two. It was a tier zero locomotives to begin with. So next time we do any conversion or replacement, we'll definitely aim for um, cleaner, higher tier. All right, and I'm scrolling through the participant list here to see if anybody has their hand up for questions. I don't see anyone with their hand up. For those of you that are on the phone, we were having some issues with you being able to raise your hand on the phone. So you can unmute yourself and I can see that you're unmuted and I will call on you by your last four numbers of your phone number. If there's anyone on the phone that wants to ask a question, that's kind of our workaround for the hand raising for the people on the phone. Could you remind um, the listeners how you, they can unmute? Oh, you can un. Oh, sorry, you can unmute. Thank you, Justin, by pressing star six. And again, if people, you know, the, we have the contact information on our website. We have general comments. Oh. The California short line is go ahead. I can't find you in the list, but go ahead. Just one quick uh, comment or, or question, and it would probably be to Caltrans and maybe to CARB, but should these regulations force some of the California short lines to no longer be able to operate? Have you taken into account the impact, not so much on emissions, but on maintenance on the roads where more truck trips would have to be made to haul products to customers that were located on the short lines, should the short lines not be able to, to get to the uh, zero emissions because of their revenues and, uh, and just generally not being able to afford the, fund, the funding to purchase zero emissions locomotives. Um, Jay, do you wanna take that one or he had mentioned Caltrans too? Sure, I, pre I mean, appreciate the comment and want to reiterate that we're starting this process, like starting the regulatory process. Up. I think it's more of a CARB question right now than a, than a Caltrans question. And we would, would have to in take all of these into account in the development of our regulation. And so that's why um, we continue to want to have discussions with you and appreciate you joining us today too um, and want to take your 
you know your suggestions as well. Thanks. <laughs> Right, and then I see Mike from, Mike Itzel from Cummins. Thank you. Uh, I think in 2017, I have a CARB question, if that's okay. Sure. CARB approached EPA on tier five uh, locomotives. I didn't hear anything back on that. Is that, is that uh, still active? Is it inactive? Is it to be reformulated? Is there any status on it? We, we've submitted the request and EPA acknowledged receiving it, but um, I don't believe we've had any other communication with EPA on it. We're, we'd still very much like to see a tier five. Okay. And then it looks like there's a question about um, the 2021 EMD battery switcher on one of our slides. Is there more information? Do we have that on our website, Justin or Jay? We do not have it on our website. Um, I there is a, uh, there's a media release and we had some uh, uh, personal communi or communications directly with EMD. But Justin, just uh, Dave, I think the response is, is Justin kind of teed up um, having future discussions as well. So, um, you know, please keep engaging with us, be part of this. We can also, uh, you could send us an email and we can put you into contact with the EMD folks as well. Um, but we wanna kind of have those collective discussions together going forward. Just kind of waiting for chats to come in here. Um, from Bill, you have a question about if we have consulted with shift2rail.org from lessons from the EU. I am i don't believe we have, but it's a great resource and we, I really appreciate you sharing that with us and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that. And again, if you look at our truck versus train and have comments on that, we'd really appreciate any input you have on that. So then from Steve Fritz says, renewable diesel and biodiesel carbon intensity levels continue to go down and could approach zero. Is there room for a tier, quote unquote, tier five locomotive using these fuels being considered zero emissions? Jay, I might have you uh, take that one. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Hi, Steve, thanks for the question. Um, we're exploring all options and we want to continue to have this conversation. I, I probably sound like a broken record. Um, and the short answer is, is we would be considering this. We have interest uh, in renewable diesel um, and it'll be part of the list of uh, technologies that we uh, assess. All right, I'm scrolling through looking for raised hands again or unmuted phone callers here. Don't see any. Anyone else on the team see any questions that I've missed? I'm scrolling back through the chat from earlier. Um, Shannon, it looks like Abby has a question on the chat. Um, I, I, okay. Are you talking about the most recent one? Um, yeah. Do you want me to read it or? Uh, I can read it. So it's for any shoreline that is part of the Genesee and Wyoming conglomerate since GW counts your equipment as corporate asset that can be reassigned anywhere in their extensive network. 
I, su I suggest you look to GNW for support in upgrading your locomotives. So thanks, thanks for the feedback and we'll, uh, we'll look into that. Thank you very much for that input. So again, you know, this isn't the end of the conversation. We're going to be working on this and we have the comment log and everything like that in our email. So, you know, keep those questions coming in and we really appreciate all your input and feedback. And if I don't see anything else right now. I'm going to turn it back over to Ajay to wrap things up for us. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I just wanted to take a second to thank you all for joining. Uh, it's a long, it was a long meeting um appreciate your participation and i want to reiterate shannon said it a ton your input is important uh, appreciate all my staff to make something like this happen uh i think we made it hopefully without too much of a technical snafu um and it takes a whole team to do that so appreciate that also the guest speakers um you know let's keep having this conversation and thank you for joining us and a reminder that during tomorrow's uh, webinar will discuss health impacts from locomotives and the proposed locomotive regulatory concepts. So those of you um, that are planning to join us, uh, look forward to talking to you then. Thank you. Thank you.